So, welcome back to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten, the show where five DMs take on D&D's top gothic horror campaign, despite any horror we might be personally experiencing. I am Dragon Akarta, your host and DM, and thank you to everyone who's watching for continuing to tune in. Uh, before we get started, we just had a very, very brief announcement. Uh, Serena, if you don't mind quickly going through that. Absolutely. So we have our own subreddit. You can join us now at reddit.com slash r slash twice bitten D D for episode lists, a full asset library, live discussion threads for each episode, and more coming in the next days and weeks. I'll put the link in chat for everyone, but you can feel free to I don't know what you do on Reddit. Do you subscribe on Reddit? I don't know. Yeah, close enough. You give a sacrifice to the blood gods. Do, do whatever you, you do on Reddit um, and join us at reddit.com slash r slash twice bitten D&D. Definitely. And a big thank you to everyone who filled out our twice bitten audience survey. Um, that was very helpful. It let us know something that some ways that you guys are interested in getting together as a community. So uh, hopefully you will join us there and we'll see you over on the subreddit. Uh, with that, we don't have any more immediate announcements, so uh, let's get started with Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So, I think with all that, let's get ready to dive right back into Twice Bitten. So, last we left off on Curse of Strahd, Twice Bitten. Trapped in the forlorn land of Barovia, the characters befriended two native Barovians, Ismark Kolyanovich and Irina Kolyana the children of the late local burgomaster. Together, the party agreed to travel to Velaki, a fortified Barovian town to the west, both to help Ismark escort his sister beyond Castle Ravenloft and to explore means of escape from this dangerous new domain. The morning of their departure, the characters joined Ismark and the local priest, Father Donovich, to bury the late burgomaster in the local cemetery. After a touching ceremony, Father Donovich urged the party to bring Irina to safety at the Abbey of St. Markovia, far to the west, or, if that wasn't possible, to protect her behind Velaki's well-guarded walls. Concealing Irina from a skulking Vistani spy, the party set off for Velaki, preparing themselves for a long journey ahead. They shared stories, jokes, and games, until the road turned to a more somber location. At a lonely crossroad, the party reaffirmed their path toward Velaki, only to find a ghastly sight when they departed. A corpse hung from a gallows in their path, pale and bloated in death. Though the others didn't notice it, Lillison recognized the body as her own, and when she touched it, it melted away into nothing more than mist. Together, the party made their way forward, carving through the Svalich wood and cutting between the towering misty peaks of the Balanok Mountains. After a watchful wolf stalked them between the forest trees, the party passed over the Sare Falls, continuing their way northwest. Upon arriving at a second crossroads, however, disaster struck. There, waiting for them, 
was a black carriage ferrying Strahd von Zarevich himself, who brought with him a pack of feral direwolves. Strahd's hypnotic words and gaze charmed several members of the party, allowing him to drink his fill from the blood of Kiva and Amity, while leaving Erthrandir on the ground, unconscious from blood loss. A defiant and fearful crossbow shot from Metreon, however, aimed in Amity's defense, seemed to pique Strahd's displeasure, and as he turned his carriage back toward Castle Ravenloft, he gave Metreon three minutes to run or make his peace. For when those three minutes came to a close, the direwolf pack had strict orders to make poor Metreon bleed. And so, Metreon. Yeah, yeah. You feel the wind rush through your shoulders as you turn and begin bolting away from the crossroads. You can see the six direwolves slowly stalking toward you. You can see the drool and saliva slipping from their mouths, their blackened gums and yellow teeth, their massive hackles rising as the muscles ripple below their fur coats. They slowly creep toward you as you run. In the distance, you can see, glancing back over your shoulder, Strahd's black carriage banking as it rounds a corner, turning out of sight in the mountains toward Ravenloft. Where are you running, and is there anything else you're doing? Yes, so... Um... With as much time as possible, uh, out of that three minutes, Metreon is running towards Velaki since that's where uh, Ismark, well, that's where we were all going, and Ismark said that it was protected. Um, but uh, not seeing it in sight, uh, uh, Metreon wants to look for a tree that's big enough to support him, but smaller than a pack of dire wolves could climb. All right, and so, he wants uh, to climb up as high as he can and hide. All right, so, uh, as you're doing that, first off, uh, Lillison, were you going with Metreon? Yes. All right, as you flee alongside him, you can hear footsteps coming from beside you, and glancing to the side, you see Irina following close pursuit. You can see her eyes are wide, and her close-cropped black hair is flying straight back behind her. We've got to get them to safety. Are the others coming? I, I I don't know. They I'm they're under some sort of uh I don't know what he did to them. You glance back and you hear a bellow from the rest of the group. Irina, wait! Uh Kiva and Amity, you see Ismark bolt to a stop and then wheel back toward you. His eyes wide, his face pale. Come on! Are you coming? We, we can't let them go alone! I'll, I'll come, just give me a moment. Kiva, after watching the carriage go away, is going to follow Ismark right away. He nods. Is Kiva carrying Erthrandir? Uh, yes, she's got Erthrandir sort of over her uh, shoulder. All right. Uh, Amity wants to go up to Erthrandir and, and sort of like, um, I, I've got this, um, and sort of like swaddle him uh, and cast Cure Wounds. All right, roll it. Okay, that's 11 hit points that Erythrindir should regain. Probably he doesn't get all of it back, though? That is correct. I get back five. Eh, good enough. <laughs> is the cure wound right. just as painful for you? Erythrindir, your eyes snap open in Kiva's grasp, inhaling sharply. I need you to make a wisdom saving throw. Gotcha. Okay. What's the result? Uh, that would be an 18. All right. As your eyes snap open, you feel lucidity coming to your thoughts. You feel the haze that had settled over your mind melting away, and you feel the sharp stabbing pain on the side of your neck where the wounds recently closed. You touch there and you feel blood coming away, staining your hands. And as your chest starts breathing hard, your eyes widening, you remember exactly what happened. What the hell were you doing? How, how do you, could you let Straw do that? The charm, whatever hypnosis he placed you under, you can feel it departing from the corners of your mind, and you feel yourself breathing hard as the rattling of his carriage echoes and slowly fades in the distance. I... what? What? He, like, bolts upright in Kiva's grip, or attempts to. He is 
kind of limp. She what? lets him go once he's once he's conscious and tries to help him to his feet. It's more she said, no time. We've got to go. And he turns to Amity. Do do you want me to carry you? I'm I'm sorry, I I, uh, hold on one, one second, and Amity uh, turns to the wolves and actually sort of hobbles back to them, uh, and she's going to cast to speak with animals. Not ritual cast, just right. cast. Ooh. While um, Amity is doing that, Kiva is going to try to get Erthrandir as far away as possible. All right, Kiva and Erthrandir set off for a run. Ismark glances toward Irina, who's still fleeing alongside Metron and Lillison. You can see there's a helpless, pale look on his face. Come on, what are you doing? We have to go now! Uh, what does Amity say once she casts the spell? Uh, um, excuse me. Um, I know that uh, Lord Strahd said that you are going to make um, Metreon bleed. Does that mean you're not going to attack any of the rest of us? One of the wolves, the largest one, snaps his gaze toward you, its hackles rising. It's people's fixate on you for a moment. So long as it is not ordered, you are the Lord's prey. We pursue our quarry. Unless you wish to join it. And it bares its teeth, revealing its dripping yellowed maw and offers you a cruel, hungry look. Um. What do you mean by that? The wolf just snarls. Defy not the lord. And you will not be our quarry. Obstruct our hunt. And you become it. Uh, by this point, right. uh, it's been around a solid minute. Uh, Metron, you were looking for a tree? So yeah, I was going to spend the first two minutes bolting, and then the, th the third minute looking and then trying to climb a, a tree that would be small enough to support me and hide. Are you going off-road? Uh, what direction are you going here? So first off, uh, as you're running forward, um, you've probably made your way a little over a tenth of a mile. Uh, you can, as you uh, continue westward, um, Glancing forward through the uh, dark trees on either side, you can faintly see a new sight uh, coming into view. Slowly approaching in the distance. You can see, coming into view, a familiar, massive set of gates You can see the fog spilling out of a dark forest up ahead beyond them. You can see the high stone buttresses, similar but slightly different from those you first saw when entering Barovia. The huge iron gates hanging on the stonework, Dew clinging to the cold bars. You can see it flanked by two headless statues of armed guardians. And in the space beyond the massive gate, you can see a dark forest rising. You're perhaps um, another minute's run from this gate. And on either side of the road, you can see Scattered trees, not very many, uh, but a few dotted from side to side here and there. Uh, are you looking to continue on to the woods, or are you looking for one of the trees on on the side of the path? Um, so, are the gates open? The gates are closed. Would I have time to test and see if I could open the gates, and if not, run into uh, one of the nearby trees? You, th by the t based on a quick mental calculation, you think you might have another minute more of running, that'll put you within, you know, relatively close to the gates, but not exactly. Gotcha, too okay. Uh, yeah, so I want to search for a tree nearby the gates then. Alright, make a survival check. God. Come on. High rolls, high rolls. Uh, for some reason, I'm clicking and it. it's not rolling for me. Odd. You want to just roll the d20 and add your mod for Yeah, me? I'll do that. Meanwhile, uh, DM, am I keeping pace with Metreon pretty easily? Yes, without overmuch difficulty. Uh, Arena is right behind the two of you. She's following your lead. 
Okay. Um, Lillison, seeing this, is going to cast her mage hand and get it ready to uh, try to get the gates open as they hurtle down the road towards it. All right. Uh, moving your mage hand, uh, it's a sight further than 30 feet away. It's going to be a while before it comes into range. Yeah, just getting it ready. All right, uh, sounds good. Uh, well, that's happening. Back at the crossroads, uh, Amity, are you doing anything more? You hear Ismark, you step to the, you put his hand to your shoulder, tugs you. We need to get going. Uh, go. They're not going to hurt you unless you obstruct them. Just go. His, uh, his eyes are wide and wild. You're not coming? I'm... I don't think that I should have struck them. He shakes his head. He's, he stumbles back. He's, he's still in your head. He's still in your head. I have to. My sister is with them. And he turns and flees, bolting after the others and leaving you alone at the crossroads. And she, she turns and, and sort of uh, tries to convince the wolves, like, I'm, I'm not going to obstruct you. I couldn't anyway. I, I, I can't go very fast right now. All right, uh, so Ismark is bolting down the way. He can't even hear you. Um, so with that, Metran, what was your survival roll? Uh, it was a big old three. All right. Uh, you spend the better part of the rest of the minute uh, looking around for a tree that you think might be easily climbable. Um, you find one tree that uh, seems of middling height. It, one, it's one of the few ones that seems to have a uh, branch lying low enough for you. Um, it seems like you could attempt to climb it without uh, over much difficulty. Uh, does it look like it's full enough that I'd be able to hide in it? Uh, inside of it? Hide in, uh, in, the, in the thick, uh, you know, canopy uh, of it. I mean, all of the trees around this area are relatively sparse. You could cross your fingers, but, um, this far outside of the woods, the trees, most of the trees here are sparsely, uh, covered or dying. Um... Um, I mean, I don't feel confident in that role. Um, how how much longer would it be for me to get to the gates? Um, probably another thirty seconds of running. You don't. You know that you've got a good head start on the wolves. It's possible. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go to the, the gates and try to open them. All right. Uh, you bolt toward the gates, and as soon as you step close enough to them, you hear. A pack's howls echoing in the distance. Amity, you can see the dire wolves snarling, and then together as one, lo following the first leader, loping quickly after Metreon down the road, bolting with incredible bestial speed. They must be moving nearly twice the speed that you saw any of the others taking off. You can see Ismark's silhouette in the distance, but you can also see the wolves slowly catching up to him. Metron, you can okay. hear the wolves howls and they send a jolt of cold and terror through your through your blood. Yeah, I can't. I hear it and I, I immediately just sort of tone, like tune it out. I tune everything out. I want to try and open up the gates. All right. Maybe, um, you, you have my mage hand. What? You have my mage hand and my axe. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what? How did I get a hand? And my bow. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So. Metron, as soon as you approach within 15 feet of the gates, you hear a great creak and then slowly shuddering. The gates begin to pull open in your direction. Almost like a muscle that has not been flexed in a very long time. They're moving slowly. Another um, inch. Can I, inches. like, dash through it uh, with, that, with as little of an opening as possible? Am I able to, like, just dash through it? You hear another chorus of howls coming from the woods, and at that point, it's just barely wide enough, perhaps no more than eight inches or so, that you can slip inside. Yeah, okay. do these, Leaving the gates, do these gates open in or out? Uh, they are opening toward you. Get get through. I'll close them behind you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Metreon uh, nods very quickly and just finishes squeezing through the gates uh, and is going to keep running. All right. Uh... You continue forward, leaving the gates behind. You can see that uh, ahead of you, another patch of the woods appears to begin 
Uh, to the left, to your immediate left, you can see the forest beginning, the side of the groves and underbrush, the dark trees waving and rustling in the cold wind that suddenly sweeps through the valley between the peaks. Are, you can see that the road continues muddy between them. Oh, fuck. Um, I'm going to keep looking for a tree that would suit my needs for right now. All right, are you staying on the path or are you diving into the woods? Um, remembering what Ismark said about veering off the path, uh, I'm not going to go too far off it into the woods, uh, but I will go off a little bit just to see if there's a tree that's uh, suitable for hiding. All right, are you attempting to conceal your trail or are you just running? <sighs> Honestly, I mean, he's he's just running on pure adrenaline right now. He wouldn't be trying to trying to conceal his tail, tra ah, trying to conceal his trail. This is stressful. Understandable. All right. Uh, so you're just running a bit of a ways off of the veering off the trail into the woods. You can hear the howls growing closer. You can hear the hair on the back of you can feel the hair on the back of your neck standing up. The trees around you shuddering and creaking and quaking as their long branches reach out toward you as if to restrain you from the for the pack's delight. Looking forward, you easily find a number of trees that you think you could easily uh, climb up and hide yourself in their upper boughs. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, again, just running on pure, pure adrenaline, the first one that he sees it feels like it's safe enough for him to hide in and for giant wolves to not climb up and follow him in. Uh, he's going to try it. All right, make an athletics check. Not an acrobatics check? Nope. Uh, climbing <laughs> is athletics. Well, that's happening. Well, listen, Irina glances toward you, her eyes wide. What are we going to do? We're getting closer. Get, get, get through. Get through. These doors open towards us, which means wolves can't open them. All right. She gives you a wide-eyed nod, slowly moves to tug in the gate, and as you watch, the gate begins pulling open without her motion. She steps back, her eyes wide, and then slips through, pulling the gate closed behind her. Uh... Sorry, if she's closing the gate behind her, am I still on this side or the other side of the gate? Uh, are, were you planning on following her? Uh, I was. All right, the both of you find yourselves on the other side. All right. Um, going to, yeah, help her pull the gate closed, then um, looking very suspiciously at the gate. Um, we passed through one of... Actually, let's, let's run first. Um and uh, starting to run again, but we passed through one of these um, on our way in. Is this, does, will we be entering some other realm now? Irina shakes her head. I, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I've heard that there's more than one of these gates in Barovia. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I think this is just another one. Okay, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's just go. She nods. Right, we've got to get after him. Uh, at this point, uh, Kiva and Erthrandir, you you come forward, finding yourselves at the gates, just as you see the silhouettes of Irina and Lillison vanishing on the road into the forest. Okay. Irene, uh, Erthrandir's going to take a quick look at Kiva and just kind of... Hold on, watch my back. And turning back to, like, further back in the forest, he is going to begin singing a desperate little song, his voice high, and cast Silent Image to create the illusion of a enormous fallen tree blocking the path, hoping that that'll force the wolves to take a bit of a detour and give Metreon a bit more time. While he's doing that, Kiva's attempting to open the gates to prepare for them to run through. All right, you've stepped toward the gates and you find you don't even need to touch them. As soon as you step within 15 feet, they creak and begin to groan, opening forth once more, flakes of rust falling to the ground. They appear to be opened, bidden merely by your approach. Okay, so um, once they're open, she's going to start pulling uh, Erthrandir through with her. Yep, he does not m need much coaxing. Once the <laughs> illusion vanishes, he's going. And she's also going to try to shut them behind her once they are through. All right. Once you're through, you can see the uh, massive log appear on the road. Where are you placing it, and how close to the gates is it? Uh, I'm placing it, like, farther back in the trail, so it's believable, and it's just flat across the road, so they have to go through more difficult terrain, and preferably high enough that they can't just vault it. So yeah, he's no, trying to block right. the path. 
He's trying. All right, are you trying to block the gates or just the path? The path in the trail that was leading up to here. Gotcha. All right. As soon as the tree appears, yeah. you can hear another howl and a snarl, and you can see uh, emerging forth from around, uh, from further down the road, you can see the uh, pack of wolves, six massive silhouettes slowly growing closer. And okay. as you pull the gates closed, you can almost see the leader's snarl muzzle pulled back. And Kiva's that, still Kiva... fucking going. Where right, is Mark? Are you going with her? Ismark, um, Kiva, for a moment you see Ismark uh, even with the wolves. And then he veers off. You hear a distant shout and the wolves continue on past him. They're both relatively close to the gates. So he's out of sight now. We can't like see him from the path? Correct. Kiva's going to hesitate a moment, tell Erthrandir to keep going and try to wait behind the gates, of course, to see if Ismark reappears again so she can let him in. All right. Uh, with that, uh, Metron, what was your athletics check? It was 13. All right. Very good. It takes, it takes a moment. You slip for a second to get your bearing, but grabbing one of the lower branches, you begin quickly hauling yourself up, pulling yourself out of the way. You can see the mist slowly swirling across the ground in your wake. Limb by limb, hand by hand, you pull yourself up and over until you find yourself in the just below the canopy of the tree, surrounded by leaves and branches and brambles. Okay, so You're awesome. trying to hide? Yes, I'm trying to hide. Alright, give me a stealth check. 25. Alright, very good. Um, with that, as you conceal yourself, you pull yourself tight behind a large bough of the tree and slowly slip out of sight. Am I... Was I able to climb up high enough to get out of, like, reach from, like, a six-foot-long wolf? Yes. Okay. By now, you think you're maybe uh, 20, 25 feet off the ground. Awesome. All right. Uh, with that, Kiva and Erythrindir, you keep running uh, down the path. There is no sign of Metreon. That's Damn good. It. That's good. Keep keep going. The wolves are behind us, and he's hiding. Yeah, yeah, but we can't outrun them. If he's, we should do. We should do that too. We need to get height. We are not outpacing dire wolves. And uh, yeah, no. There's. We're not going to be able to do much good for him if we run out of range of wherever he went. Okay. Okay. So. Can, can you climb a tree, or can I help you climb a tree? You're a ranger, right? I, 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 not a good one, but yeah, yeah, some help would be lovely. And he's going to look for a tree that pretty much the same qualities as Metreon, tall enough and sturdy enough that he can get up on it, but not so big that... Basically, yeah, he's looking for a big, tall tree to clamber. All right, given the uh, environment you're in, it's not overly difficult to find one. All right, he's going to kind of look at Kiva. Can you boost me? Kiva will boost him, just keeping also keeping an eye around for any nasty creatures. All right. Uh, if you want, you can make an athletics check with advantage, Earth Uh Kiva, you can make a perception check. Can do. <sighs> That's a nine. A nine? Uh, a nine. With advantage? With advantage. Beautiful. Uh, you scramble up, struggling. The first branch breaks beneath your weight and both of you stumble backward. In the distance, you can hear the creaking groans of the gates as they open once more. And you can hear the howls growing closer. And as you struggle to pull yourself up a second time, you can hear the distant sound of the pack's snarls growing audible. You can try again if you'd like. Uh, if I do, will they be on me if I fail? They seem pretty close. Kiva's going to take her scimitar, um, slice across her hand, rub blood on her face, uh, collapse to the ground, and play dead. Kiva, they're smart. They're not gonna... What else can we do? This! And Erythrindir is going to pull out his wand, give a frantic slash, and cast invisibility on himself. You, they're not after you. Just be careful. So Kiva's going to keep doing what she's doing. All right. Arthur Deer vanishes in a swirl of mist. Kiva still alone on the ground, 
between the trees. Metron, you can hear the pack growing closer. Um, yeah, he's got his crossbow out, and it's, it's shivering and quaking and clinging it to his chest, uh, breathing very deeply, but also trying to control his breath and, and his volume, and is trying to stay as still as possible. Gotcha. What is Lillison doing? Um, has Lillison seen Metrion go up into the tree? Uh, if she was keeping up with him, then she uh, would have, but I don't believe she hmm. was, because she stayed behind with Irina. So Irina and her are still running somewhere down the road, or at least they were last time we left off. Okay, so uh, Lillison will keep running, um, and noticing that Metrion isn't around, um, you know, at various points she's going to thrust out her hand um, and try to cast message to Metrion and keep trying until, uh, you know, eventually he picks up. All right, so what's the range on that? That is a good question. The range is 120 feet. All right. Um, I would say that as you're running... It's also blocked by three feet of wood. Yes. Um, I would say that given that Metron didn't go overly far into the woods, you get one message. A single one of them catches as you make your way down the road. What do you send? Are you all right? Where are you? I'm fucking hiding, love. Okay. Uh, Lillison will... Um, with eight con, I don't think she's going to be able to run very, very long at a sustained pace. So she's going to, after getting that message, stop and just sort of double over, catching her breath um, at the side of the road and uh, try to shrink back into the trees. All right. Irina follows behind you with a silent nod and slowly pulls into the trees alongside you. Are you attempting to hide or just pulling yourself off of the road? So what Lillison's going to try to do is um, if any of the three charmed party members comes by, uh, she doesn't think this is going to work on the direwolves, um, but she thinks it might work on the on the other three, um, she's going to just try to pretend that Metreon has kept running down the road. Gotcha. Uh, looking out, you see no sign of the others. Okay. All right. Uh, cool. So, with that, Amity, are you still back at the crossroads? Uh, Amity is going towards the rest of the group, but will probably take a while to get there. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Amity slowly making her way forward. Kiva, concealed on the on the ground as best she can. Erthrandir vanished into invisibility. Lillicent and Irina hold up on the side of the road ahead of Metreon's hiding place, and Metreon tucked away on top of the trees. Is Mark nowhere to be seen? Metreon. You hear the distant howls growing closer and closer and closer. As I hear that, is it possible to climb higher as my like as my action? It it is, but you would need to hide again. I'm totally fine with that. Alright, go for it. So I'm gonna do that. The actual 20, so 26 total. <laughs> God right. bless. You shimmy up a bit further in the tree until you're just barely beneath the top of the canopy. You can almost poke your head up and see the the soft mist and fog that hangs over the trees. You can see the overcast sky overhead, and your view of the ground is completely obstructed. You hold your breath, tucking yourself in and willing yourself to be as still as possible. And then... A slow silence settles over the forest before you hear it. You hear a soft snarl, another howl, then a final howl echoing it. And then the howls quiet into soft snarls as they slowly begin approaching your position. You can hear below 
the sound of leaves crunching, branches snapping. You can hear the wind whispering through the trees, softly stirring the leaves around your hiding position. You can hear a low growl emanating through the undergrowth. Slowly, you can see the mist spiral its way across the forest floor below, and for a moment, you catch sight of a massive black furred body. And then it slips from your sight. You can hear the growl intensify, met by a second, then a third, as slowly massive paw pads break through the ground, the loamy earth crossing through the soil. You can hear in the distance a bird cry, a raven's caw echoing through the dark woods. You hear the growl mount to a crescendo for a moment and glancing strict, straight down. You can see through a faint hole in the leaves the head of a massive black dire wolf its gaze pointed forward, its nose, nostrils flaring as it sniffs and scents the ground. There's a moment of pause where slowly its gaze begins to lift up. You hold your breath. And then the wolf's gaze snaps onto the tree next to you. It snuffles and growls, a low snarl bubbling up in its throat and slowly begins patting its way away from your tree. You hear the set, two other sets of paw pads slowly accompanying it as they gradually make their way away. You slowly count to ten. The growls are quieter. Count to twenty. A distant howl met by two answering snarls. And then silence Metrion is, is has his back against the trunk of the tree uh, and is still looking down at that spot where he saw the head of that dire wolf uh, shivering uh, almost as if he's f uh, in freezing temperature uh, still has his crossbow to his chest uh, but he's going to wait there for a little bit and just kind of Take in the, uh, taken the relative safety, but also to just make sure for absolute positivity that nothing is following him anymore. All right, Kiva, as you're lying amidst the earth, you hear a low growl echoing from the opposite side of the road. You see one of the dire wolves lurking on the opposite side, just out of the corner of your vision, as best you dare to see anything. It slowly steps toward you, sniffing, scenting the air, and then growls and turns and lopes away into the darkness. Erthrandir, you hear in the distance a pair of cruel howls echoing through the woods, Lillison and Irina hearing the same. And then slowly the howls fade. Arthur Deer is going to wait for a long, long minute. And then once he's sure that they're well and truly gone he's going to carefully pick his way back through the trees to the road kiva too not necessarily realizing that that's earth and deer is going to continue to stay a stock still on the ground um she's not going to move at all just because she feels like there's still something around her uh 
uh, Amity is continuing going forward on the road, but if she sees any signs that uh, anyone has sort of jumped into the woods or anything, um, that'd be good to know. All right. As far as you can tell, there's no sign of anything up ahead. You've made your way around halfway uh, forward, and you can see the gate coming into sight, slowly becoming more visible. Um, Lillison, you hear something crunch in the undergrowth behind you. Lillison will whirl to face it, uh, trying to put herself between whatever it might be and Irina. You whirl around, pushing Irina back, and see Bismarck. His boots slightly smeared with mud, holding up his hands. It's okay. It's just me. Where are the others? I... I... I don't know. Um... Matreon kept running, and I can roll deception for that if you like. Um, uh, did you see where the others went? He shakes his head. No. I've just been trying to follow the road. You said they kept going? Yes. He nodded. And what of the others? And he answered his sister, Irina, and, and are you okay? She nods. All right. Do we know? We don't know what happened to Metreon. As as far as I saw, he kept running down the road towards Velaki. He nods. Metreon, as you continue waiting in the tree, you can hear a soft snarl bubbling up below you again. And as you do, you can see very faintly another black, massive black gray wolf slowly making its way across the earth below your tree. A low growl fills the air. The other's howls are distant, but this wolf is still lingering. You watch as it sends the ground sniffing and growling in frustration, and continues to slowly circle the base of your tree, piece by piece making its way in almost a figure eight around the grove in which this tree stands. A constant growl at the base of its throat. It doesn't see you, but it seems frustrated, confused and you can see it still slowly making its way around the edge of the trees. Yeah, I mean, he is petrified right now. <laughs> um, uh, he's going to stay as still as possible. All right. While you do that... Um, Earth and and Kiva, what are you doing? Does he see anything once he gets back to the road? Looking around, make a perception check. Alrighty. Nine. I'm afraid not. Okay. So... About how far is he from the gate? From here, if you... Probably to try to bolt it, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Okay. Hmm. And can he... I presume with a 9, he can't see if there are still any wolves in the area or not. I'm afraid not, no. There's no indication that you can see. Okay. Well, in that case, he's going to... Yeah. Make sure he's going through the underbrush just to not leave footprints, and then take off for the gate at a run. Alright. So if you're trying to not leave, leave footprints, give me a survival check. Can do. Eleven. Alright. You do your best to avoid leaving any evidence of your presence. Avoiding breaking through brambles or branches, and 
keeping your tracks clear of muddy patches, staying to dry earth. You carefully begin making your way back toward the gates. And by the time that you do, you can see a silhouette slowly approaching Amity. Okay. He's going to wait until she's made it most of the way to the gates, come up to about 10 feet of her, and then say, Hey, I know you can't see me, but I'm here. It's me. Uh, Anthony. Yeah. Are, are you all right? Yes, yes. I, and, and you? Uh, kind of. I think the wolves got a little, uh, shirty with me when they figured out that I was trying to make an illusion to block their path, but I don't see them anymore, and I can't hear them. Or, have you seen anybody else? No, everyone just ran forward. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I just, we... Well, the good news is, we don't see any signs of Metreon, so... Hopefully he's well out of here. Mm -hmm. the, the wolves told me that if you don't obstruct them, they won't attack you. I, I mean, you were there at the cemetery with me, right? Yeah, yeah, I was there. With the, the march of the ghosts. I remember. Right. I'm going to have some words for Metreon if, if we meet with him again. Oh, but me too, believe me. But what do you mean about the cemetery? Well, we were told that all those ghosts were people who'd previously crossed swords with the vampire. Yeah. So, doing something like shooting a crossbow at the vampire is probably a bad idea. Oh, incredibly stupid, yeah, but he was a... Never mind. We'll, we'll talk about it later. But, yeah. Want to see if we can find the others? Sure. Alright. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll do my best to help you along, but might be hard to do that while invisible. I'll try it. I'll, like, crouch. So you're just, like, waving your arm out jauntily. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, he will do that. So after um, Earth and Deer, or she hears the footsteps uh, go away from her, she's going to uh, take a breath, get up, and then continue down the road um, away from the gate. So she's going further into close to where she thinks the others might be. All right. You slowly make your way through the woods back toward where the others might be waiting. As you do, Metron, you hear the wolves' steps fade away from you. And then as the howls echo in the distance, you hear its presence fade and then count one minute, two minute, three. And then you hear its paw pads slowly approaching once more. And you recognize it by the pattern of spots on its blackbird back. This is the same wolf. It's the second time you've seen it. Whatever it's doing, it's seems to think there's something nearby and it's still patrolling um um excuse me uh noticing this uh <laughs> metreon's gonna climb up higher and then try to hide try to hide again i mean it doesn't seem to see you and there's not really anywhere else that you could climb okay in this that's tree. fair that's fair top. um there are yep. only a few spaces it seems to be like sniff snuffling upon the ground trying to scent the air and, you know, every, you know, it, it vanishes for two and a half minutes at a time. But if you listen very closely, you can occasionally hear a snarl distant from a, from a few dozen yards off. It keeps returning to this area. I mean... Yeah, uh, I mean... 
if Metreon keeps seeing this, he is willing to sleep in this tree if it means him not having to face this giant dinosaur wolf. All right. After a while, uh, Lillison is going to cautiously send another message, just trying to keep what she's doing um, as surreptitious from Ismark and Irina as possible. Uh, so another message to Metreon. You still alive? Okay. I will assume he is not still alive. All right. Uh, with that, um, Earthrendir and Amity now together at the gate. Which direction were you headed? Uh, and was Kiva with you? No, Kiva's not with them at all. She went in the opposite direction. Gotcha. All right. So, Kiva, you're still heading down the road westward, right? Yes. Towards where everyone else all was right. running off. All right. Uh, Lillison, you hear footsteps slowly coming from the woods on the opposite side of the road. And as you glance through the underbrush, you can see Kiva slowly making her way through. DM. Yes. Would it be possible to, like, throw my voice to make it seem as if I'm in another area for the wolf? Um... Ventriloquism is a trained skill. Yeah, that's I what I would thought. not allow it without some kind of feedback, yeah. Probably. All right, fine. That's fine. Okay, so I see um, Kiva coming. Yes, and Kiva, as you make your way forward, you see a flicker of movement in the uh, underbrush on the opposite side of the road. Can she see what that flicker of movement was? Make a perception check. <laughs> That's a 16. You, for a moment, catch a glimpse of Lillison's face peering between the underbrush. Uh, Kiva, upon seeing that, will look around and just make sure that she's not being um, watched by anyone else, and then uh, sort of give a, like, by the side wave to Lillison, and then start to walk over. Well, Willison is going to flinch a little bit and then uh, go back to her plan of uh, pretending to be doubled over, uh, catching her breath. So once she's close enough to Lillison, obviously not in her range for touching, um, she's going to say that uh, I, can't, I can't see the wolves anymore. I played dead to let them go, but I don't know where Arthundir and Amity are. Are, are you okay? Uh, yeah, just, uh, we kept running, and um, I, I don't see them either, but I've been hearing them for the last few minutes. Well, hopefully that means that um, Metreon got away. They seem very strong and capable. Uh, I, I can only hope that he's maybe safe. I mean, last I saw him, he was I would say clear on his way towards Falaki, so... Okay, so we can, uh, we can catch up with him there, I suppose? I, I hope so. Okay, Kiva at this point, now that she's in some sort of relative safely- holy shit, those wolves are terrifying! Um, she is going to sort of collapse, exhausted, uh, and, you know, just try to take a, a moment Lillison would like to... Is there anything I can roll to see if um, Strahd's influence is still on her? On Kiva? Um, I mean, yes. You didn't really notice anything visible. So, okay. not as much. Okay. Uh, Lillison will straighten up and go out towards the road, glancing back um, a bit fearfully towards Ismark and Irina. Um, she's going to go back to the road and start walking back the way that they had come um, every so often, like, doing another message test ping. Sorry, Irina and Ismark exchange glances and fall in behind you. Kiva will also go after the group. She doesn't want to be left alone here. <laughs> All right. Uh, what are are Arthur and Deer and Amity still at the gate, or are they making their way down the road? Uh, we were making our way down the road, as far as I know. 
All right, Lillison, uh, around 30 seconds after making your way back down the road, you hear the spell catch, reaching its target. What do you send? Are you still alive? Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a, one of these wolves that just keep, they keep tracking me. Kiva has caught up to me. I don't know how much I can trust her. Uh, Ismark is with me. I... He seems there's something off with him. I don't know if I can get to you. I... I'm not too far from the gate. Okay, Wilson will look around um, and just say to the others, Stay here for a moment. And without uh, any explanation, she's going to uh, go off in a direction, um, hopefully seeing, uh, you know, hopefully trying to uh, see if she can catch a glimpse of either this wolf or Metreon. He had also left tracks too, so I mean, uh, there's that. (laughs) Yeah, but Lilithan doesn't have survival skills. (laughs) Fair enough. All right. Uh, As you do, you hear footsteps slowly approaching from the east of the road. And as you take your first steps off the path into the undergrowth, you can see Erethrandir and Amity rounding the curve. You can see Amity, Erethrandir still got invisibility, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, Lilson will wave a little bit at them and then proceed to ignore everybody else and go into the woods. Lilson, where are you? And she's just gone. I don't know. Everybody's being a little weird today. It's understandable. Do you, do you think we should follow her? No. Not at the moment. You know her. If she wants... If she's slipping off alone, she has something she wants to do alone. She's probably going back to the tavern. <laughs> Oh, God, I wish. I would uh, kill for some wine right now, I'm not going to lie. Same. Yeah, uh... <laughs> Pity, though. I don't think I can afford to get drunk at the moment. Well, I, I don't know. It would be nice to meet up see... with the others, just so that we don't have to walk to Velaki alone. Yeah, that would suck. Do we see any signs of the rest of them? So, I mean, at this point, you did come around the corner and you saw Ismark, Irina, and uh, Kiva on the path, and Lilison with them for a moment before vanishing into the, into the trees on the other side, on that side of the road. Oh, so okay. So we are together now. Oh, hello! Hey, sorry. No, I'm not really here, but I'm here. Kiva? You all right? Uh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just a little exhausted, obviously. Um, and she sort of, like, absentmindedly plays with the wounds on her neck. Um, but she's, you know, also focused on staying as close as possible to the others. She's a little spooked. Yeah, yeah, understandable. (sighs) The wolves haven't come back, have they? Not that I've seen, no. Okay, good. So, we've got you, we've got Irina, we've got Ismark, we've got Amity... And Lillison just looped off to do Corellian knows what, so we just need Metreon. Uh, Lillison said he kept running towards uh, Velaki, so um, I think the plan is to try to meet up with him there, I suppose. Oh. Oh, did... All right. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. That's, yeah, it's a good idea. Irina, Bismarck, y'all doing all right? Bismarck nods. Irina does the same. She glances worriedly at the patch of forest where Lilith and vanished. Is she going to be all right? I'm not sure what she was trying to do. She just w- went off the road. Yeah, I don't know. She might be trying to make sure that the wolves aren't sneaking up for a sneak attack or something. That sounds like her. 
She nods, is Mark echoing her motion, but not looking entirely convinced. So listen, uh, as you break through the tree cover, leaving the road behind, what are you looking to do? Um, I'm going to keep keep message pinging until I can, you know, triangulate where Metreon might be. You eventually get a generally good sense. You find yourself around a grove, um, a number of taller trees scattered around the area. You feel that Metreon must be fairly close by. Okay. Do I see any signs of the giant wolf that he mentioned? Make a perception check. That is a seven. Glancing around, you see no sign of it. All right, Metreon. Is the wolf still close, or has it wandered off? Uh, DM. <laughs> Make a perception check. Fifteen. You close your eyes, opening your ears. You hear a branch snap just off the southern end of the grove. You glance through a part in the leaves and you see a flash of black fur for a moment, and then it vanishes. Uh, I lean forward a bit to try and as like I'm trying to lean into that sound, but as soon as I hear the snap, I immediately slam, slam back against the uh, trunk of the tree. Yeah, yeah, it, it's over there. And I, uh, um, do I know what direction it was coming from? Yes, you can give an, a, an approximate uh, sense Gi of which side. Yeah, I give uh, I give um, little Lillison uh, the direction I heard it coming from. All the others are together on the road again now. I don't know how much I can trust those who were affected, but if you want to come down and make a run for it, we're all here now. I, I, uh, I only heard the one. Maybe, maybe we could take it. Just you and me, or everybody. I don't know. I don't fucking know. Oh, fucking hell. I can't stay up here forever. And Metreon is going to slowly uh, and as stealthily as possible climb down out of, his, out of the tree. Alright, give me a stealth check, please. Ten. Alright, you slowly begin making your way down out of the tree shimmying down the side of its trunk and branches and find yourself on the ground. And as you step forward, the ground below your foot gives way. A small sunken hole in the ground where a root had wormed its way through and the earth and soil had eroded. You hear several leaves crunch beneath your foot and immediately you hear a, a growl from behind you, perhaps a dozen yards away. You can see a massive dark shape pulling itself up, dark glowing amber eyes glaring at you from the opposite side. Uh, seeing that, uh, and figuring that it now knows where he is, he is he's going to start to dart uh, in the direction towards the road, hoping that he encounters Lillison on the way. All right. As you do, rapidly making your way forward, you hear the wolf howl. And as it does, a moment later, you hear an echoing from afar, the rest of the pack answering. The wolf lopes fo forward, snarling as it begins making its way, gaining ground in you as you flee. Yeah. What are you doing? I'm fucking running. <laughs> that's that's all I can do right now. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna. Uh, are we doing chase rules or are, is it like? Uh, do I have my cutting action movement or is it just? Um, all right. So if you're just trying to hide and flee from this dire wolf, um, you can try to. Uh, escape which direction are you running from? um i was running back towards the road um 
so whatever the, that direction was, but knowing that I have now gotten their attention, um, I'd say I would still run back to the road to see if I see Littleson, um, and then at that point try and find somewhere else to hide. Gotcha. All right, you bolt back to the road. Um, we're going to say, for the sake of this, the wolf is a bit behind you, so we're not going to dive into a chase just yet, but you bolt through the trees. Littleson, you see Metreon speed past you and burst onto the path. The rest of you see Metreon panting hard, running at a snarl echoing from the undergrowth behind him. Everybody move! And Come on, we gotta, we can't just let him just kind of looking around. Aerithrin Deer doesn't even stop and just takes off racing after him. As Mark throws Metro on a glance, go! Don't worry about it! I'll take care of this one! And you can see him draw his longsword from its, from its sheath and hold it high, the steel glinting in the dim light. While Ismark is doing that, Kiva takes uh, Irina by the hand and starts pulling her along as well. Irina breathes. Shouts back to Ismark, Be careful! And she turns and runs with you. You have but a moment to see the tree line begin to shudder and then burst with leaves and brambles and branches going flying everywhere. A massive, dark silhouette of the wolf bursting from the undergrowth flinging itself through the air, its paws outstretched, saliva dripping from its muzzle, and Ismark standing tall against it, long sword raised up as he, with a cry of defiance, raised his sword above his head, and then Metron, you vanish into the woods on the opposite side. Yeah, uh, that's that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Erthrandir is doing his best to stay pawed on his heels. All right, is everyone running with Metreon? Yes, Kiva uh, is still trying to pull Irina along and follow. Amity is following right. slowly, uh, looking if there's another wolf. Make a perception check. Uh, on it. Seven. Seven? Uh, there's no immediate sign, but you can hear distant howls growing closer. All right. Lillison is going to make her way after Metreon towards the road. Um, when she sees Ismark standing there, um, she is going to nod cautiously towards him and say, I stand with you. All right, you're standing with Ismark? Yes. All right. Um, as that happens, um, so... I will need, um, everyone to please roll initiative for me. Ah! Okay. I don't wanna. Dragna, do I have to? Are you running? Then yes. Can you make an active encounter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we, we need uh, just, just roll your own initiatives and then tell me what the result is. Uh, we can't without a... Oh. There's not right. a button. We'll just type it out, though. Yeah, yeah we'll roll it. Okay. That is a 13. 19. 21. <laughs> Jack of all trades, I love you so. Three. Oh. Oh, right. Amity still has exhaustion, doesn't she? Oh, no. Yeah, I looked it oh. up. Turns out that applies to initiative. Oh, God. Wow. That's not ideal. All right, and Metron, what do you have? Oh, sorry. Uh Three as well. Oh, sorry, mine was actually a four due to Jack of all trades, so I am beating Metreon here. All right. With that. That's a natural one of my initiative. Yeah. Oh. 
All right, Erthrin Deer. Yes. You are up first. You're just running forward? I'm trying to keep pace with Metreon. Can I, like, how close am I to him? Uh, you are reasonably close. Maybe just, you know, 20 or so feet behind him. Okay. In that case, still invisible. He's going to take the chance to try and triangulate where any other wolves are coming from. If we're, like, going to be running check. into one. Okay. <laughs> Nine. Running as fast as you can, it's hard to tell. The howls are coming from multiple directions. It feels like the pack's split up. It's difficult to tell which ones are closest. Okay. In that case, he's just going to use his action to dash and uh, try and keep up. Action. Ah, bollocks. In that case, that's my turn. All right, Kiva, you're up. Kiva is, uh... Can she take her action to dash if she's still, like, tugging Irina along with her? Um, you can assume that Irina is going to do her best to follow you. Okay, yeah, so that's what she's going to do. She's going to use her action to dash and pull Irina with her. All right, uh, while that's happening, uh... I will need Aerithor and Deer to roll 1d20 for me, please. Got you. That's a 10. All right. Uh, with that, one moment, please. And a reminder, I am still invisible for the moment. I'm going to say that is a really ominous request, though. Yes. Yeah, I hate, I yes, hate it that. Is. It's my least favorite thing. I'm not a fan. All right, so, uh, as you make your way forward, you hear... Another howl coming from the underbrush. Uh, Irina, or not Irina, uh, Kiva. You see dark eyes glaring at you from the underbrush, and then a dark, smaller shape hurling itself from the trees. An ordinary wolf, gray and silver fur, but now emerging from the underbrush, throwing itself toward you. It's going to attempt to attack Kiva. Okay. That is a 23 to hit. <laughs> yeah, I think that hits. All right, you suffer six points of piercing damage. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, uh, it bites at you, and for a moment you're able to smash it in the side with the boot, limping and keeping forward. It whimpers as it goes spinning off to the side. And then you see it vanish behind the trees. Uh, with that, uh, Kiva dashes forward. Um, Kiva, what is your constitution? Which is a 13. Alright. Um, what is your constitution modifier? It's plus one, I believe? Uh, yes. Yes. Alright, you can dash a total of three plus your constitution modifier times. So, I will need you to subtract one from that. Okay, so she's got three left. Alright. As that occurs, you hear a distant howling from the wolves. Uh, you can better pinpoint their location. You think that if you take a moment to listen, you might be able to tell where they're coming from, but they'll arrive here fairly soon. Perhaps not imminently, but imminently, but fairly soon. And as that happens, uh, Lillison, uh, you see the wolf bursting from the underbrush and rearing up to attack is Mark. Okay. It rolls a 23 and hits, dealing 11 points of piercing damage as it bites into his shoulder and he snarls, throwing it off, blood dripping from the wound on his side. Would I have been close enough to make an attack of opportunity? Um, you were beside Ismark? I would say no, because it's still next to Ismark. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, that is the end of the wolves' turns. Um, Lillison, you're up. Okay. Um. Gosh. Um, Lillison will try to sort of sidle away such that she is not right next to Ismark and is not hampering his swings, um, but is still, you know, kind of flanking the wolf with him. Um, and 
she is going to screw her eyes up very tightly for a moment and then shake her head and just push her hand out with the green gem on it and um, uh, just let the poison mist fly. All right. So, uh, con save, please. You got it. That is a 10. Okay, that will be four poison damage. All right, very good. The poison sprays across it, and you hear it snarl in minor pain and annoyance. It doesn't seem overly injured, though. Okay, and uh, with... Um, I don't know whether this is considered a bonus action or not, but uh, she is going to reach down and grab the dagger that has been hidden in her boot this whole time and uh, keep it ready. All right. Very good. Um, with that, that is the end of Lillison's turn. Uh, Ismark is up. He is going to bring up his longsword, and he is going to attack twice at the dire wolf before him. Come on. Let's go, Izzy! One. Hits. 14 to hit, dealing 6 points of slashing damage. Aight. Second one also hits, dealing 4 points. My boy. And then... One moment, please. I believe he also has a short sword here. Yes, he does. You watch as, for a moment, he slings the long sword into his other hand, whirls into a scabbard at his side, and pulls out a second sword tucked away into his belt, a short sword, whirling to hit the dire wolf. That's an 18 to hit. God, our boy! God, he's so pretty! Seven points of piercing damage cutting into the thing's side deep. It Our snarls, boy. stumbling. All right, Irina, so with that, Ismark is going to end his turn, and with that, Irina needs to make a d20 roll. All right, uh, sorry, is, uh, with Irina. Um, Kiva, as you're pulling Irina forward, dashing ahead, you hear her grip suddenly slack in yours as she lets out a cry of surprise. You hear something pull taut, the sound of a rope snapping tight. And Irina is going to attempt to, as you watch, you see a hunter's snare pulled around her leg as she instantly struggles to try to evade it. Can Kiva assist? <laughs> uh, you cannot. Uh, she yelps as the rope pulls up and what had been hidden underneath the leaves and earthen soil of the forest, a sudden net appears, ensnaring her and pulling her up as she sh shouts in surprise, is hoisted up, dangling in the canopy above. Okay, uh, I'll figure that out on my turn then. All right, um, with that, she is going to bring out her rapier, struggling and slice through the net, holding onto the rope at the top with eyes wide. She struggles to hold on, and you can see her slowly being to climb her way up to a, a branch, but she appears to be uh, still quite a bit of ways behind you. Okay, she Kiva would have stopped running the moment she was caught to try to assist her and keep her with her. All right, so you can do that on your next turn. Cool, thank um, you. Um, with that, next up is Amity. Let me uh, have Irina roll something for you. All right, uh, Amity, uh, you're just kind of slowly making your way forward with the others. Is anyone carrying you, or what is your status? I don't think anyone's carrying me, no. Um, all right, so are you making your way as best you can behind the others? Yeah, uh, is Speak with Animals still on? Duration was 10 minutes. At this point, no, I would say it's expired. Okay, understood. Uh, and, uh, how far behind them am I, then? Uh, you hear them rapidly fading away into the distance. Okay, uh, if, if I approach, um, Irina up in the tree, then I'll try to help her out, but... Uh, otherwise, I guess I'm just going to sort of keep making my way. 
All right, go for it. Um, with that, I need you to roll 1d20 for me, please. Fun. Uh, is this an ability check? Nope, it's just a straight d20. Fun. Uh, nine. All right, Metreon, thanks to Amity's roll. As you make your way forward, panting, chest heaving, doing your best to dash through the darkness, you miss a step and suddenly the ground causes you to stumble as you find yourself stumbling and falling down a sudden hill through the woods. All around you, the branches turn sharp, the underbrush turning to brambles and thorns and slashing vines. Uh, as you do, I need you to make a dexterity saving throw. Amity or me? Uh, Metro. On. You can either make a dexterity saving throw, or you can expend uh, 10 feet of mint to try to go around the brambles. Uh, I'll do a dex save. Alright. Nope, six. Alright, you stumble through, and one of them goes right down your face, cutting a long gash. You take 10 points of slashing damage. Oh god, my beautiful face. Not again. All right, uh, with that, you can keep going. Uh, if you would like to dash, you can dash. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna dash my little heart out. Clutching my beautiful face, now bleeding from the cheek. All right, uh, just mark that down. As a reminder, you can only dash a number of times equal to three plus your constitution modifier. Yeah, my con modifier is two. All right, so you can dash four more times. Uh, with that, Metreon. Uh, I will need Metreon, Amity, Irina, Kiva, and Aerithrandir to, if you would all like to try to hide from the wolves, you can all make a stealth check. Oh yeah, she's gonna try. Yeah, yes, please. please. 16 for Metreon. Uh, 23 for Aerithrandir. Eight for Kiva. All right, and Irina rolls and four for me. Oh, all right. So, Erthrandir. Yeah. You see an opportunity to duck off the path, swiftly concealing yourself in a large uh, hollow of a tree, away from the path you've been beating. You're able to scurry inside the large dead trunk, and you feel your breath hitch as you watch the others following behind you. You think that you'll be concealed in here if you choose to stay. Uh, Metreon. Um, you continue on forward and you veer to the left and as you do you can hear howls approaching you still feel exposed same for Akiva and Amity can I hide in plain sight since I'm still invisible I prefer to keep pace with Matreon if at all possible um make a nature check for me alrighty so you know that Wolves are exceptionally uh, deft listeners. Their ears are fairly sharp, and you suspect that that along with their sense would allow them to track you if you were to keep moving. So, to be clear, is my choice to hide or to keep after Metreon? Correct. Then I'm going to keep after Metreon. All right. Very good. Uh, with that, we're back at the top. Metreon, roll a d20 for me, please. I don't think I want to. <laughs> I'm gonna need you to. 17. All right. Uh, Erthrandir, you face no troubles as you invisibly do your best to keep pace. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, he, how far is Metreon from me now? Uh, Metreon is um, around 20, 30 feet ahead of you. Okay, he's going to dash to catch up. And then kind of murmuring as quietly as he can. Hey, Erythrandir, invisible. Where are you going? What's your plan? Uh, Metreon doesn't say a word. He's just... Uh, the only thing that you can hear from him is just the, the panting of his breath. Okay. Okay. All right, sure. I'll do the thinking for both of us then. We can't outrun these to town. Probably. Actually, would Erythrandir remember how far they are from Balaki, roughly, based on Ismark's um, estimate. You and... estimate you're probably a good few hours away. Shit! Alright. 
Not the best. In that case, yeah, he's just going to keep pace with him for the moment and yeah, stay by him. All right, very good. Uh, with that, I'll need you to roll 1d20, please. Gotcha. 20. All right, Kiva, you face no obstructions, but you can see Irina uh, far behind you uh, clinging to the net as she slowly does her best to make her way through the branches of the tree back to stability. Uh, seeing that Irina is not behind her, she's going to go back for her um, and make sure that she's in sight um, and with her scimitar pulled. Um, and she's going to make sure that she's traveling with Irina still, so she's going to go back and get her. All right. Irina, shut down. Don't worry. I'll be okay. Just make sure the Metrion is fine. Kiva um, leaves her shield on the ground for Irina. Um and then runs off with her scimitar. All right, uh, you'll be able to start moving on your next turn. Uh, with that, you hear the chorus of wolves. They appear to be imminently close. Uh, Lilith, and you can hear uh, several howls coming from the south of you, fast approaching your direction. The rest of you feel, the rest of you hear a few other howls fast approaching from your left and right hand sides. Uh, with that, the wolf remaining on the road will lash forward to attack uh, Ismar. That is a 22 to hit, dealing 13 points of damage. Ismar grunts as he stumbles back, uh, doing his best to avoid but taking the brunt of the damage. The wolf snarls, tearing into him. Uh, that is the end of the wolf's turn. Lillison, you're up. Okay, um, how badly does Ismark, um, look hurt? He looks like he's beginning to get, uh, in wounded. He's not exceptionally heavy wounded, but he could be bloodied pretty soon. Okay, um, in which case Lillison will pant a little bit and say, Should we get ready to start running soon? Ismark snaps his gaze toward her. We can try to... Slow this one down, he shakes his head. If the others reach your friends, I don't know how long Metreon will survive. I know, I don't I know. want them to reach him. If you want to run, run. Just... I, I... I don't want to run, but I want to make sure that... you don't get left as food for these... Closes his eyes. Uh, make a persuasion check. That is an 11. <sighs> he nods. Right. I need to be there for Irina. And he pulls up his longsword to block another blow of the wolves. All right. What do you propose? Uh, a few last good hits in, and then we run. He nods. All right. After the others, or in a different, in a different direction? Uh, after the others, I think. He nods. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, um, and with that, Lilison, anything you'd like to do with your action? Yes, I would like to... Uh, Lilison nods firmly to Ismark, then um, flips her dagger up and takes a stab as hard as she can. <laughs> that's not very hard, because that's a six to hit. Unfortunately, it flies wide, the wolf twisting out of the way, avoiding the attack. Okay. And with that, uh, I would like to disengage and then run. All right. You flee into the trees, vanishing off the road, leaving Ismark behind. Um, all right. Oh, uh, Ismark, oh my. Turn. Interesting. Intriguing. All right. Uh, so he's going to attack twice with his longsword. Uh, miss hit, dealing eight points of slashing damage. Good boy. Good man. In that last moment, you can see that the wolf seems to be heavily wounded, bleeding from several points along its body. Then he pulls his short sword out to drive it one last time. It misses, sliding across the side of its hide and failing to cut through. He curses, shakes his head, and turns to begin running after you, Lillison. All right. 
And with that, as he begins, as he's making his way forward, Arena's still holding herself up in the tree. Uh, Amity, you're slowly making your way forward as best you can. Uh, yep, with that four stealth check. All right, I will need you to roll one d twenty for me, please. Fun. That's a four. Ah, favorite number today. All right, Metreon. Um, as you continue speeding forward, doing your best, you see the earth suddenly fall away, a deep pit, a crevasse opening up before you. Um, I will need you to make an athletics check or an acrobatics check to avoid falling into the crevasse. 15. Acrobatics. You nimbly leap your way from one side of the pit to the other, avoiding losing any speed. Uh, it's your turn. What are you doing? So I'm going to... Um... I'm going to use my movement to run, and then... I... I'm going to try and hide. Is there anywhere I'd be able to hide? Um, so you'll automatically make a stealth check at the end of the round, but you can try to make a hide check uh, on your turn as well, if you'd like. What, would there be any benefits or uh, uh, you would get to roll lack twice. thereof? Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll do that. 22. All right. You find a hollow uh, just by a stream. For a moment, you splash into it, doing your best. And for a moment, a memory flashes in the back of your head. Water scatters sense, right? You splash into the little creek, making your way to the side, veering off away from the group, and then dive into a small hollow, a pit in the side of the earth, just out of sight of the rest of the group. Uh, that's, I guess, my turn. <laughs> Alright, the rest of you see Metreon dive out of sight. There's no sight of him. Would you all like to hide? No. Kiva all can right. try to if she sees that. Are you, Arthur, do you're still running? I'm... Would hiding put me in a position where I can't interact with, like, anything that's going to be coming after Metreon, or no? Uh... You would be able to do things uh, after, well, no, hiding would mean that you are present in the vicinity. Okay, yeah, then I'll hide. All right, uh, Kiva, are you bolting forward or, or are you attempting to She's hide? She's going to hide. All right, um, Lillison, are you hiding or are you bolting forward? Lillison? Uh, she's out at the moment. She's away from keyboard. Oh, all good. No worries. Um, okay, so uh, what did everyone get? Uh, 13, presuming I don't get a benefit from invisibility for this. 16. Uh, I would say that you do not uh, gain a benefit from invisibility. Yep, gotcha. Um, Kiva, 16. Okay, great. So, each of you dives off of the road. Amity, are you hiding as well? I mean, so from Amity's perspective, people have sort of run by her in one direction and then run by her in the other direction, right? <laughs> this is in the middle of one of those Scooby-Doo hallways. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a bad hill <laughs> Right now, the woods around you are quiet, except for the distant howling. As far as you can tell, there's nothing immediately nearby you. These wolves have already told her that they're not going to hurt her if she doesn't obstruct them, so I don't know if she's particularly even scared of these wolves. Right Reasonable. Now. So right. I'm just, like, going to so make my way back to the road. Just her and Truffle just frolicking right. through the woods. And Truffle's probably a little scared right now. <laughs> Alright, Amity pauses and slowly begins to make her way back to the road as you see uh, Lillison and Ismark speeding past her. Uh, Lillison, are you attempting to hide, or are you bolting forward to attempt to catch up to the others? Uh, I am dashing as, as fast as I can. Alright, very good. Uh, with that... You continue forward, and the forest falls quiet as Lillison and Ismar continue dashing forward. You veer through the brush and see Amity, eyes wide, facing the opposite direction from you. And then you pass by her and she's gone, a silhouette vanishing in the woods. As behind her, you can see three massive wolf silhouettes barreling their way through the underbrush. Erthrandir. Yes? Kiva, as you hide yourselves, tucking yourselves between the trees out of sight in the bushes, you can see three other wolves slowly beginning to make their way, the howls giving way to snarls as you can see dark silhouettes, massive, beginning to approach through the darkness. You pull yourselves into the trees, and as you do, the howls to the south intensify. 
Okay. Lorthin, you watch as as Mark turns and the wolves lope forward, catching up with you. They don't appear to be continuing forward. As Mark shoots you, or they appear to be continuing forward and not stopping toward you. And these are, to clarify, dire wolves. You can recognize them as the same ones from before. As Mark glances at you, listen. They're going to get there first. I, I, I don't know if I can run faster. Do, do you want me to try and slow them down? We have this one moment, and then they'll be ahead of us. Uh, y yes. And she's going to uh, slow down. Um, I don't know how you want to adjudicate uh, in terms of initiative or anything like that, but um, if possible, Lillison will try to uh, send an acid splash towards two of them. Alright, go for it. And Ismark will attack uh, with his longsword at another. That would be uh, two deck saves, please. Very well. That's a 10 and a 22. Okay, the one that rolled a 10 uh, takes one acid damage. Alright, uh, Ismark swipes twice with his long sword, cursing when he misses. Swiping forward with his short sword. Connecting and slicing across one of their haunches, dealing nine points of piercing damage. But the wolf snarls and continues loping forward and soon leaves the two of you behind in the darkness. And with that... The wolves vanish into the woods ahead of you after your friends. And so... Erthrandir. Kiva. Yes. You huddle into yourselves. Quietly. Silently. Trembling. Watching the trees for any sign of movement as the wolves slowly creep forward padding through the underbrush. You can see each puff from their enormous muzzles blasting hot air into the chill gust that blows through the trees of the Svalich wood. You can see each of them slowly begin to make their way forward. There's no sign of, Earth, of, of Metreon. You pull into your hiding place. How, how close are they? How close is he? There's no sign of Ismark or Lillison. The wolves slowly make their way around you, sniffing the air. And then one turns and locks eyes directly on you, as another does the same toward Kiva. They slowly begin stalking toward you, eyes glittering in the darkness. Okay. You can see it sniffing the air, its amber gaze fixated directly upon your unmoving person, step by step crunching through the underbrush, its massive paws, each one of them bigger than dinner plates, as its fixated gaze glows like an ember in the darkness, until it's mere yards away from you. Kiba, you see its fellow close nearby, exhaling, snarling, the third one behind it, lifting its muzzles to the air and sniffing, snarling at evident frustration. The two dire wolves fixate you with long, steady glares. And then, with a final growl, turn and lope off ahead into the wood. Their howls fading as the howls of others behind you grow closer, and then you see three silhouettes speeding off on either side of you, vanishing into the northern wood, and disappearing into the darkness of the trees, as all six dire wolves vanish, their snarls and howls slowly echoing in the faraway distance, the pack continuing its hunt, following its quarry, away. And then slowly, they fade 
and vanish to nothingness. As soon as they're away, Kiva's squeezing her eyes shut and she's trying not to have a fucking panic attack right now. Erythrindir is just running on adrenaline at this point and he's, once he's sure they're gone, he's going to look around to see if he can find any signs of where Metreon went. Alright, and as you slowly emerge from your hiding place, the wolves' distant howls fading into the darkness far, far away until they are not to be heard or seen. That's where we'll take our break. Okay. Good. Good. We're having, fun. We're having, We're having fun. how much fun? I thought my limp would put me in danger. Turns out it's keeping me from me. being put in danger. Hi, this is Dragna Carta, DM of Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten and author of Curse of Strahd Reloaded. Today, I'm going to walk you through my process for assembling Strahd encounters from scratch. You can see this method in action every Saturday on Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten, a 100% rules as written campaign that I run for five other Curse of Strahd DMs. According to Curse of Strahd, Strahd von Zarevich should appear often throughout the campaign to tempt, terrorize, and toy with the PCs. His efforts are driven by his search for a successor or consort, and to this end, he pressures the PCs, tormenting and dividing them to see how and when they break. Like any criminal or villain, Strahd's appearances are defined by three factors. Means, motive, and opportunity. Means are the tools he uses to torment the PCs, motive is his reason for doing so, and opportunity defines when and how he shows up. Together. These limiting variables make Strahd an interesting and complex adversary. Let's start with the third factor, opportunity, and work our way backward. Strahd is neither omniscient nor omnipresent. As such, he needs intelligence to carry out his attacks. He can learn of the PC's locations and intent through his spies, be they wolves, bats, Vistani, or others. Each of these wandering spies reports back to Castle Ravenloft at dusk and dawn, limiting the flow of information. But remember, Strahd has an intelligence score of 20. A genius like him can easily assemble small pieces of evidence into a scarily accurate conclusion. He can test these conclusions through the use of his scrying spell. Free of the sun's chains, Strahd is free to scry on his enemies at all hours of the day. Once he obtains a possession or body part from one of the PCs, he may target one of them. But until then, he is also free to target Irina Koliana if she's traveling with the party. Strahd can appear to the PCs at day or night, but as a creature of night, Strahd favors the time after dusk, especially because he can more easily find his prey while they're resting. However, if his spies have provided him with good information, he may predict where the PCs can be found and lie in wait to intercept them. He can even direct his wandering spies to report to him in the field. While they won't return to Ravenloft until dusk or dawn, he can likely encounter them in the wilderness of Barovia. Strahd's approach may change depending on the PC's location. If the PCs are behind a threshold, he may have to knock on the door and charm his way in. He might have his minions break through the windows or claw through the ground, or even set the structure alight with a well-placed fireball. If the PCs are in a fortified location, like Argenvastolt or Van Richten's tower, Strahd may seek to catch the PCs unaware when they exit. He may send his minions in to spy on them or steal their belongings, but his best case scenario is finding the PCs outdoors unprotected, and vulnerable to his assaults. Finally, don't forget that certain special events can cause Strahd to automatically appear or provide him new information. These include Aragal's Ride and the Lady Vokter's Wish event, the Assassin's Mirror in Velaki, or Irina's escape at the Blessed Pool. Strahd does nothing without a purpose. To this end, 
He will always approach the PCs with at least one of five main motives in each encounter. When Strahd is socializing, he's seeking to introduce himself to the PCs and instill respect and terror in their hearts. He may ensnare their minds via charm or partake of their blood with his bite, but he won't attack outright. When Strahd is performing espionage, he is seeking to gain information about the PC's capabilities. He did not appear outright, but nothing prevents him from lurking outside the PC's windows and listening to their conversations with detect thoughts or his supernatural perception. Strahd might also attempt to corrupt the PCs, either by dividing their trust or by coaxing a PC to his side with promises of vampiric power. He may direct his attacks at one PC while favoring another, or approach a character in private with promises of aid. Strahd is also always looking to intimidate the PCs. It's always good to show up every once in a while to let his subjects know who's boss, especially if they've acted rudely or defiantly. Often, he'll lean on his minions to do the dirty work, or he'll work to destroy a sanctuary they found. Finally, Strahd is a tyrant, and tyrants love domination. Even if no PC is worthy to succeed him, they're still outsiders, and there is nothing Strahd loves more than crushing outsiders beneath his heel. Finally, and most importantly, Strahd has two sets of tools at his disposal, his minions and his stat block. Let's look at his minions. His direwolves and wolves are reliable allies in the woods, but don't forget that he can charm guardsmen to allow his creatures to enter fortified settlements. His bats can easily enter through open windows and chimneys, while his ghouls and Strahd zombies can claw their way from the earth beneath the PC's feet. His vampire spawn alone are blocked by a threshold, and for good reason. They pose a far greater threat than any other minion, and will destroy any party that lacks the Sun Sword or Holy Symbol. Finally, Strahd can also show up alone, and depending on how you play it, that may be the most dangerous encounter of all. Strahd also has his stat block, the most powerful weapon in Barovia. You can divide his capabilities into three buckets, his primary vampiric features, his secondary monstrous features, and his tertiary magical features. Strahd will begin by relying on his primary features, expose his secondary features if the PCs prove a threat, and reveal his tertiary features only when he wishes to see the PCs dead. Because the PCs will encounter Strahd many times through the campaign, I recommend revealing and focusing on only a few new features in any given encounter. Strahd places cards close to his chest, and a steady drip of new information can give your PCs a chance to learn his capabilities by heart. Strahd's vampiric tools comprise the bulk of his primary features. He will use these to strike fear and terror into the PCs' hearts, and to teach them their place beneath him. His charm and bite can expose the PC's vulnerabilities, while his regeneration and unarmed strike can make him a deadly threat to low-level parties. Fogcloud will set the stage, and Polymorph can teach disrespectful PCs a lesson, so long as their wisdom score and character level are low enough. His Children of the Night feature highlights his dominion over beasts, and his legendary actions will reveal a monster of supernatural power and speed. Strahd's secondary features reduce his mystique while exposing his monstrous side. He may disguise himself or attack as a beast, spy on the PC's thoughts to manipulate or eavesdrop, or vanish into the darkness, only to attack from hiding moments later. He may aim to taunt or disgust the PCs through animate dead, or wield his spider climb to gain deadly, if less respectable, advantages. Finally, if Strahd is truly looking for a throwdown, he'll dip into his tertiary features. Here, he may conceal himself as a cloud of mist, or vanish into thin air via greater invisibility. If he's seeking death and destruction, he'll cast Fireball or Blight, or he may wield animate objects for a symphony of pain. There are as many potential Strahd encounters as they are DMs. To see some in action, you can check out my own examples on Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten, airing every Saturday at 1pm Eastern at twitch.tv slash rcurseofstrahd, or you can watch the full series thus far at tinyurl.com slash twicebitten. And should you find yourself at a crossroads on a misty night, with no company but a black carriage and a tall approaching shadow, don't try to run. It'll only make him enjoy it all the more.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten. Before we get started with the second half of today's episode, just a few minor announcements. Starting with a quick shout out to our continuing VTT sponsor for this campaign, Foundry VTT. They've got a lot of awesome updates coming out to help DMs run their best virtual games. Highly suggest you guys take a look. So, uh, next, Twy, do you want to go? Yes, yes, I do. So, to all the lovely people who have subscribed to us on Twitch, thanks. You continue to be the best. And for you, we now have some new emotes for people who have subscribed with Tier 1 subscriptions. That would be the Nat 20 and the Nat 1, which, unfortunately, we've had opportunity to use a lot of the latter, which were made by the lovely Jack, and you can get for only $5, or with your Amazon Prime, which I'm sure you have sitting around somewhere. Take a look. You might might be under your couch cushions. But yeah, we appreciate any subscriptions, and know that the money goes towards making this stream the best stream it can be. Thank you so much. And next up, Serena? All right. Sorry, I'm typing a bunch of Bs right now. So, um, as I said earlier, we have a new subreddit. It's reddit.com slash r slash twice bitten d and um, On there, we will have an episode list and asset library where you can get episode summaries, uh, links to soundtracks, Dragna's audio playlist, links to all of our graphic assets, and the Session Zero documents used for the stream. Coming soon, we will have episode recaps um, and art and meme galleries. There will be live episode discussion threads, and we'll be posting future YouTube and podcast episodes to there as well. As always, you can submit artwork, ads, and memes to twicebittencos at gmail.com. Make sure to submit everything there, even if you've sent it on Twitter or Discord. And our Deadpool is still open, so that will be, uh, I'll put that link in the chat in a moment. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you, Serena. Uh, so, uh, with that said, I think that's all the announcements we have for now. We are open to feedback on the subreddit. Feel free to uh, post there, discuss in the Discord. Uh, it's a work in progress, but we're hoping that it'll be a, a helpful community resource to you guys. Um, otherwise, thank you all for sticking around, and let's dive right back in to Twice Bitten. So... With that, Erthrandir, as you slowly creep out from your hiding place, the wolves having long since vanished into the darkness of the shadows. Kiva, you do the same, stepping forth into the cold, dark wood. You hear the crunching of leaves and approaching footsteps, the clanking of metal from behind you, and turning, you see Lilithan and Ismark panting out of breath, but appearing from the corners of the trees. Oh, you're alive. Where's Irina? You hear I, footsteps I... slowly approaching from behind, and you see Irina, her face pale, poke out from behind a tree. I... Is, is everyone here? I heard... I heard everyone we... coming this way. We don't know where Matryon is, but he's somewhere along this riverbank, I think. And Amity's... Is Amity behind y'all? She can't move that fast. She needs help. Yes, we ran past her. Uh, there were wolves. Um, I suppose... Uh, should we go after Metreon still? I guarantee he's within like 500 feet. We just need to wait for him to figure out it's all clear. Well, maybe he doesn't know that and he's hiding again, or maybe the wolves went ahead of us all. Should we go find him, I think is probably the best thing. I can try to find him if you go back and make sure Amity's okay. Go ahead and... She'll... I don't think they're gonna hurt her. Maybe try your message. See if he's around. I... I know they probably won't hurt her, but if she runs into anything else along the way... Right, right, right. Gotcha. And Erthrin Deer will take off back towards the path. Alright, as you do, Irina pulls up beside Kiva. I... I... Sorry, I, I know that you left this for me, but, um, I guess now that the wolves seem to be gone, um, 
I, I can give it back, and she holds up the shield a bit sheepishly. I, I didn't get the ju juice out of it, but uh, if, if I had come up with any of them, I, I know it would have been a great help, so thank you. It's, it's no problem. I'm, I'm really glad you're okay. And next time, um, I won't run away. I'll, I'll make sure you're down. No worries. Uh, I was, I'm just glad that all of you were able to be safe. I don't think they would. She frowns. And you can see her turning a thought over in her head, and she just breaks off and looks contemplative. Uh, as this occurs, um, Lillison was making her way back to the road toward Amity. Was that it? Uh, no. Lillison and will. Was. Yeah. And will. Gotcha. All right, Arthur and Deer, you begin making your way between the trees, passing back toward the main path. Um, what is everyone else doing? Lillison, Metreon? Uh, Lillison is going to do her Metreon message triangulation uh, routine again. All right. I would say after uh, three or four tries, you feel the spell snag on the receiving end. You can send a message if you can make it. Well, hello again. How are you doing? So this entire time, Metreon has been in a fetal position hiding in this hovel, this little hollow, um, pointing his crossbow out, uh, just in the hopes that nothing comes. Uh, but if it does, he can shoot it. Um, but not seeing anybody but hearing Lillison. Um, are, they, are they still out there? I, all right, I don't know for certain, but I heard them all moving off somewhere, all six of them. Uh, is it safe to come out? I think so. We got wounds into three of them, and all the rest of us are together again. No, 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 I don't want anything to do with them. Sorry, what? I don't want any fucking thing to do with them. I'll, I'll meet they... you. Tell me where you're at and I'll meet you. Alright, I'll come a little closer to you. Uh, Metreon will very carefully start to poke his head out of the hollow look both ways, make sure nothing's coming downstream. Uh, and if nothing looks like it's uh, approaching or watching him, he will very carefully step out across the stream and head towards Lillison. All right, the two of you reunite your boots squelching through the thick, sodden mud. Metron, as you make your way out, peering cautiously over the crest of the earthen mound below which the small choked creek runs you can see kiva and irena is mark standing there Irina offers a small wave metreon glares uh, but i will say the two as metreon was getting out he would have washed his face in the stream of the blood and the makeup that was covering it so now he's just kind of himself again um but he he glares over lillison's shoulder and looks to her what was going on with him? We, they, we can't trust him. Um, has he crossed the stream yet? Yeah. Okay. Lillison will belatedly uh, wipe off... Actually, her dagger didn't actually hit anything, so she's just going to belatedly slip it back into her boot and uh, draw closer to Metreon. And she shakes her head a little bit and... Um, Lowering her, lowering her voice so that only Metreon can hear her, she says, I know, I don't think we can absolutely trust them either, but you remember what happened to us, you and me, back in that house. Are you saying that they're, they're possessed by, by ghosts or something, by, by Strahd? I don't know if it's ghosts. I don't know if it's him. But this is, this is something that he's done to them. This is not them. I don't know how 
it goes away. No. I think I think it'll go away with time. No. But but no. 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 And uh Metron starts to march forward. Uh she's going to try to grab his arm. Yeah, he'll like when he feels you tug, he'll stop and just kind of uh whip back towards you. Look, I know very well that you have experience pretending to be somebody you're not. And that is going to come in handy right now. I, we need to know how much information he can get through them. And we need to do that while not giving off any indication that there's anything wrong the fuck are you talking about? These people could fucking kill us. As I you know. Say that you hear is more coloring. Are, are the two of you all right? Do you need a hand getting up the hill? Uh, no, we're fine. Just catching up. Smart glances toward Kiva, frowns, and then his brow creases, and he takes a slight step back toward Irina. But... Otherwise, doesn't speak further. He just keeps a watchful gaze on the tree line and a hand to his sword. Metrion, listen to me. Right now, you, and maybe Irina, are the only person I can trust to be in their right mind. And whatever is happening with the rest of them, it will go away in time. But I don't know how long that will be. And we need to keep our cool defend ourselves against whatever might happen, and just keep a very watchful eye on them until then. I've never been- I've never been good at holding my tongue. I know. But... You have been good at not revealing your hand, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. When I need to. Well, I think now is one of these times. So, you know, put what happens if they don't snap out of it? To be. If they don't snap out of it, we play along until we can't anymore, and then we run. All right? I'm I'm going to, I'm going to Valaki with them. I'll, I'll, if they're coming with Ismark and Arena, I'll, I'll go. But the minute I'm there, I'm out. I can't do this no more. If they're not out of it by the time we get to Velaki, you can run. You can run either with or without me, as you please. But we need to get information first from them as to what is happening to them and what we can do to prevent it from happening. I... Uh, because you know it, it can happen to us too, in the future, if we're not careful. But we was careful, and that's the fucking point. The, the person who's been here the longest yells at them, Don't fucking look up! And what do they fucking do? They look up, they look into his fucking eyes, and you see what fucking happened. Are you saying we can trust Ismark too, then? I mean... He and Irina are the only blokes and, uh, and birds I could trust to hear aside from you now. And, you know, uh, he does kind of like a hand wave motion towards you. No offense, but I don't really know you. I don't really know them, but at least you know, one of them's drawing swords and, and trying to get us out of here. Trying to get us to safety. Yes. Well, I don't know whether... Yes. We can't look at him, and I don't know whether whatever the rest of them have now is contagious, whether they're his spies or anything, and we need to know these sorts of things. So, if... Look, Metreon, you've... That was a very brave thing you did back there. Stupid is what it was. And Metreon starts to walk back towards the path. Yes, it was that too. But... Brave nonetheless. 
I see I'm going to have to revise my opinion of you now. Metreon's just kind of quietly uh, moving as quickly as he can, uh, trying to almost keep in pace with Lillison enough, but also keeping his distance. Uh, but he'll move back to the main road with everybody else. All right, so at this point, you're still a bit of a ways away from the main road. Uh, you're still in the woods. Um, is Mark and Irina offer you a nod? Is Irina offering you a, um, a warm but slightly hesitant smile as you return to the group? So are we going to go find Amity and Erthrendir? Or are we, we're still heading to uh, Valaki, right? Yes. Uh, are you, yes. Are you okay? Are you okay? Sorry, that was the first question I should have asked. Are you all right? Well, and he gestures towards the large scratch on his cheek and jaw. A, a little bit of a, a little bit of a nick, but I'll be all right otherwise. Uh, how about you two? And he looks at his mark and sees the blood on him. Oh my! This isn't good at all. Listen, uh, I, I just care about getting to safety. So if that just means going without talking too much, I'm fine with that. But. Are you okay to move? As Mark nods, he winces a bit, and you can see a long uh, slash down his side, evidently drawn by uh, sharp teeth. You can see a bit of ragged flesh uh, having been raked through by sharp teeth. I'll be all right. And he kind of like pulls his uh, uh, leather armor over it, um, the uh, splint armor over, kind of shifting slightly with the weight as he winces. I think that the important thing right now is getting all of us to safety and shelter, and we can worry about, um, well, we can worry about other things once we are behind uh, Wallachie's walls. If we're assuming we're all right, I think that it might be best to meet with the others if you are ready to do so. Yes, that sounds, uh, sounds reasonable. Nods. All right. Kiva, Lillison, shall we return to the others? Lillison just nods, uh, tremblingly a little bit. Kiva um, is very exhausted and sort of hanging back away from everyone, but she, uh, she'll get up very slowly and sort of follow the pack from a distance. All right. Together, the lot of you begin making your way through the dark woods, approximating, approximating as best you can the path you took from the main road to this darker part of the forest. Uh, Erthrandir, at this point you cross over into the underbrush and once more onto the road. Uh, Amity, were you just waiting on the road for the others to return, or had you gone somewhere else? Um, Erthrandir would probably have found Amity pretty quickly uh, if he was returning to the road for her. Alright. Okay. At this point, you find her waiting in the road. Uh, Amity, you can see Arthur and Deer emerge. I'm assuming the invisibility is... It's off, off yeah. <laughs> Amity right. is sitting cross-legged in the road, strangely calm, holding truffle. Hey. Hey. Did the others... Yeah, yeah, they're, uh, they're fine. Alive. Everyone's alive. Good. Yeah. Uh, well, we should, uh, meet with them, shouldn't we? Yeah, do you know where they are? Yeah, yeah, just, uh, follow me. And he kind of kicks at the bit of dirt with his boot, apparently not quite knowing what to say. And, uh, Amity? About, uh... I know, he looks up and he's suddenly uncharacteristically intense. I am not going to bring this up in front of the others because I am attempting to be less of a asshole than I could be, but you offered to sell us out back there. All of us. What? Yeah. You said take them before he even looked into your eyes and did the mind whammy thing. Look and Take them, just don't hurt me. Oh, I, I didn't mean you. I, I meant... Irina. And that's... better. 
we all saw the in the cemetery the 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 ghosts. We know what happens if you oppose him. And oh, I know damn well. But just <sighs> never mind. I I get it. I if I had decision. tried to oppose him, do you think it would have worked? Oh. Goodness, no. Not in a million years. <sighs> Alright. Just, uh... <sighs> we are gonna meet him again. You know that, right? Mm-hmm. We, we should. Um, he said that he might have a way to heal uh, my leg. Earthenbeer's face goes momentarily into a rictus of panic, and then he composes himself. Right, right, yeah, of course, he, uh, vampire powers and stuff. Yeah. Let's get, long, let's get you back, alright? As long as we have a stone talking to you with Metreon about not shooting him with a crossbow bolt, it's going to be fine. Yeah, naturally. Just, uh, maybe we save that one for tomorrow. I think we all need a... a night. You need me help getting back? You need me help walking? Or are you good? I'm going to be fine. Yeah. Good, good stuff. And P will head back towards the others. All right. The group of you meets a bit of a way off the road, not too, more than a few dozen yards from the main path. Erthrandir meeting with the rest of the others, plus Ismark and Irina. And together, if you'd like, you can make your way back to the road. Yes, please. Yes. All right. The group of you together regroups with Amity on the main Svalich road. The dark woods falling away through the road that veers ahead away from you that turns and vanishes into the misty, dark earth up ahead. As Mark sighs, if everyone's all right, then I guess we've got the town to get to. Yeah, make haste. Does anyone have any link injuries? I uh, I can patch you up as best you can if you want before we get going. Guess Mark was rather wounded. I, oh goodness, that is a uh, nasty. And yeah, he will throw a quick healing word on his mark if he consents. You don't need to... And then you cast the healing word and he... He, like, grunts in surprise and he puts a hand up to his shoulder where you can see the flesh beating to heal and knit back together somewhat. Just don't want you to bleed out. And how many does he regain? Three. Alright, he exhales. Oof, that... That hurts like heck, but, um... Oh. Yeah. He kind of rolled his arm experimentally. There's there's still a bit of wounding there, and it might scar over, but... All right, um... That wasn't the most pleasant, but it seems to have stopped most of the bleeding. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll not do it again if you don't want me to. Uh, no, it's all right. I just needed to get used to it, I suppose. It... <laughs> again... Magic. I, I can see why it uh, comes in handy. <laughs> Quiet. Shall we then? Let's keep our eyes sharp. Already... He's already kept walking. Yeah. As they kind of make their way along the path, Earthwindir is going to start talking kind of aimlessly as if to no one. Yeah, no, uh, reminds me. I should go and send send my friend a message and he kind of proffer, grabs the stone around his neck meaningfully about all this. I know she'd love to hear a message from me about everything that's happened. <laughs> She's not going to believe it. Just all the vampires and nonsense. It's really going to be a lot to talk about. Just should be sure we get some privacy first. And then and Wilson rolls her eyes and uh, sends Eric and Deer a message going, What? He's out of my mind. Are you certain 
How do you no. know? But the sort of hazy veil over things appears to be gone. The sort of, you know, smell of honeysuckle. Oh my, what a lovely man this vampire is. Yeah, no. Not feeling that anymore. Doesn't mean I'm clean, Lil necessarily, but yeah. Lillison is going to narrow her eyes at nothing in particular. Um, can I make some sort of insight to see if uh, this seems believable or seems like some sort of double front? That's up to Aerithrin, dear. Oh, uh, sure. Roll it. Okay, that's 11 insight. Oh, uh he doesn't seem like his li he's lying, but then again, you've never really seen him lie. Um, okay. Lillison will nod a little bit, um, as if to nothing in particular, and then say out loud, It would be very nice if your friend could, uh, send some sort of help, really. Oh, wouldn't it? I... <laughs> Man, can you imagine the army marching through into the mists and the yanking us out of here? It'd be lovely. Your friend commands an army? <laughs> oh, I wish. No, but uh, she's very good at twisting people's... No, no, she does not. I don't want to give anybody false hope, but she could probably command, like, a bunch of people who owe her various favors for various criminalities. So, uh, less knights in shining armor and more the roughest bunch of motherfuckers you ever will meet. Metron's yeah. been keeping with, uh, with Ismark and Irina, uh, since they seem to be towards the front, and is holding his tongue as best as he can, but every time Arthur Deer speaks, he's just <laughs> sucking his jaw, clenching his teeth, rolling his eyes. <laughs> Uh, Ismark seems to take it in good nature, but you can see that Irina doesn't seem to be even listening to um, Aerithrin Deer or paying attention to you. Instead, you can see Irina keeps glancing back nervously over her shoulder, and uh, Metron, you can see that her eyes flit from Aerithrin Deer to Kiva to Amity, then back again before she turns quickly, almost as if she hoped that no one saw her looking. Just, just, just keep up. That, that's the best we can do for now. She glances up at Ismark, lowering her voice. Are they are they still? Ismark closes his eyes. It's possible. I don't know how long it lasts. I think we might want to try to ask some probing questions once we're in Wallachie, but for now we just need to get to safety. Hi. Um excuse me. Uh yes. Ethendir, uh Amity, uh Kiva. What's up? Uh, could you just say something for me? Sure thing. Can you say Fox Strahd? Um, Fox Strahd? Fox Strahd? Strahd! Can you tell me how much you hate, can can. Much you hate him? I would prefer that he be dragged through the mud by dogs, and then torn apart by said dogs, and then stitched back together, torn apart again, and then had the pieces mounted on pikes for all the children to come and marvel at. That's nice to hear. What about you, Kiva? I... I don't hate him, but I do... don't like... Friends don't do what he did. At least not the kind of friends that I've had. Well, he's your friend, though, is he? That's what he said. Is he your friend? Oh, he's, oh that's what he said. Amity, what about you? Metreon, we need to talk. I know you weren't there. What about with... you? Say it. I know you weren't there with Erfindir and me and, and Kiva in the cemetery, but did did anyone tell you what we saw? This is rich. And uh, Metreon just turns his head and keeps going. Nice to talk Irina to you too, down. asshole. Metron, you hear Irina slowly exhale. Is Mark sucking in a breath? Well, at least now we have a better idea. Irina closes her eyes. 
Wait. Tomorrow. I, I remember how this works. It has to be done by tomorrow. We'll have them back. It'll be okay. Lillison is going to, after just hearing all of this with a rather amused look on her face, she's going to turn to Erythrindir and say quietly, When did it happen? When I woke up, I uh, saw Amity peel on me and just, it was like somebody had torn a veil off my mind. It was, I don't know how else to describe it. Does this mean we're going to have to knock the rest of them out and then revive them again? I, uh, I don't think that's what that was. When I woke up, it was the memory of him, of me bowing my head and him. He kind of makes an expansive gesture. You know, that was what I was thinking of when I woke up. The teeth. And the smile. Wilson lowers her eyes and then nods once. Um, she pauses and then um, sends a message to Metreon, um, half hoping to, you know, ha half expecting not to get any answer. Um, but she is going to say, Erthrindir's all right, truly. Metreon's brow sort of furrows in disbelief. And he turns and looks over his shoulder back at you, Lillison. Lillison just nods a bit. He glances up at Erthrindir, not saying anything but his brow still furrowed, looking him over. Erthrindir will turn back and meet his gaze. And kind of without saying anything, he's going to jab at the bite marks on the back of his neck. Metreon just gulps down any anger that he's feeling in this moment, looks back at Lillison, remembering what she said, and then turns back towards the road. Rathrum Deer will do the same. All right. You continue on forward through the dark trees. Another 5, 10, 15 minutes go by, and before long, the trees give way, breaking once more to a pair of peaks as the Balanok Mountains once more rise up on either side, the path continuing forward between the craggy cliffs. You continue on, passing your way through the narrow valley as the road bends and turns with the contours of the cliffs and mountains. You can see great craggy gray cliffs with old dead tufts of grass and blackened brambles dangling over the side like dead strips of hair. You can see dead trees lurching, craning over the sides as if members of a ghastly audience leering at the passers-by as you slowly make your way below their gaze, the short, stubby, dead brambles and branches reaching out into the sky as if in a hopeless prayer. The sky overhead is dark, the thick gray clouds of the overcast sky drifting toward the horizon. A half hour goes by. Another 30 minutes, and here, the Old Svalich Road transitions from being a winding path through the Balanok Mountains to a lazy trail that hugs the mountainside as it descends into a fog-filled valley. In the heart of the valley, you see a walled town near the shores of a great mountain lake, its waters dark and still. A branch in the road leads west to a promontory, atop which is perched a dilapidated stone windmill, its warped wooden veins stripped bare. Ismark exhales, his shoulders slumping in relief. All right. Looks like we're lucky. We're close. And you said that those walls are secure. That's the best I know. 
Will we get there before it, get, it grows dark? He glances up at the sky, squinting at the gray overcast clouds. It's difficult to tell. We will be getting it close, but I think we should make it. Well, then, let's not waste any time. He nods. Hmm. Y'all know anything about this windmill? I didn't see any wheat crops coming in. Would Kiva recognize this windmill as the one that's on her shield? Uh, yes, the design is identical. Kiva, you can see that um, the windmill that you're seeing in reality seems quite a bit more dilapidated and run down than the one on the shield, but thinking back on it, you recall a deed to a windmill that you found in the Durst house that matched the description of the one on your shield and the one upon this hill. She's going to clock that, but uh, keep it to herself. She really wants nothing to do with any more buildings, <laughs> suspect buildings in, uh, in Barovia. All right. With that, are there a lot of you continuing on ahead? Yep. Although, yeah. All right. You continue on forward, leaving the old windmill and promontory behind and passing forth as you follow the road as it descends down into the valley. The old Svalich road meanders. The valley watched over by dark brooding mountains to the north and south. You continue on forward for another hour, hour and a half, and soon the woods recede, revealing a sullen mountain burg surrounded by a wooden palisade. Thick fog presses up against its walls as though looking for a way inside, hoping to catch the town to slumber. You continue on forward for another 15 minutes, approaching, and the dirt road ends at a set of sturdy iron gates with a pair of shadowy figures standing behind them. Planted in the ground and flanking the road outside the gates are a half dozen pikes with wolves' heads impaled on them. This is this looks reassuring. <laughs> yeah, they uh, have some combatants around. Uh, um... DM, uh, at some point, uh, Metreon, seeing the like, seeing us get closer to the building, he would like to try and reapply uh, the cosmetics, the disguise kit. Of course, I'll assume that you would have done it over the course of your travel. That by now you've had it uh, thoroughly reapplied. Okay. As you do, you can see that the sky overhead is beginning to darken day, beginning to turn to dusk. Is Mark Granson nod? All right. Hopefully, we can get inside quickly. Is there a, is there a qualifier, or do they just let people in? I don't know. Hopefully, uh, well, they can see us, right? We don't. Uh, we're not suspicious. We sh I think we should be alright. <laughs> is Mark? We are covered in blood, slime, and most of us aren't human. <laughs> Point taken. Is just, Mark? Uh, is is yes. your family name known here? That. He pauses for a moment, thinking. It is possible? I'm not sure. Like I said, I've not been here in quite a while, but I would also ask if we would like to reveal ourselves. I know that you did go to the trouble of disguising my ah, sister. Ah, yeah, yeah, point. To you, how we wish to approach If we this. want, uh... Well, if we want to add ten minutes to Strahd's commute, then yeah. Let's stay undercover for now. He nods. All right. Um, I'll follow your lead then. And he follows in beside you. You continue stepping forward, approaching. And as you do, one of these shadowy figures behind the wall steps forward. You can see it appears to be a woman, uh, tall and somewhat slender, but holding a long pike in her hand that reaches far above her head. She appears to be wearing simple armor and a uh, muddy brown cloak tinged with gray patches that falls over her shoulders. There's a weary, quiet look to her eyes, and she holds up a hand. Hey there! Who are you? Wilson looks around and uh, quickly whispers, Who is speaking for all of us? 
Uh, I'll do it if people don't mind. I think I look the most human-esque, aside from Ismark and Irena. Metron looks back at you and narrows his eyes, almost offended. Ah, right. Same for the Amity, actually. Point. I can... I do not have time for this. Afternoon! Uh, we are travelers from Brovi Village. Seeking, uh, shelter and work here in Velaki. The woman looks at you with a long, hard glare. You can see her companion beside her, wearing a cloak over her shoulders and similar gear and attire. Uh, a man, slightly taller and squatter than she, um, fixates his eyes upon you. The woman speaks again. You're looking for shelter, you say? And what after that? What is your business in Velaki? Well, at the moment, we are looking... Find some work, make some coin, contribute, and figure out our next plans. That is the idea. The woman eyes you for a moment and then scowls as her gaze circles over the rest of them. Hmm. She gives a nod to her companion and he grunts and moves to begin pulling the gate open. It creaks and groans with the weight and effort of it as slowly it opens wide allowing you to pass onto the cobblestone road that leads down the central avenue of the town. The woman glances toward you, holding her pike close to her side and giving you a long, searching gaze. All right, but be warned. None of you are to cause trouble while you're in these walls. <laughs> Baron Vargas Velokovic tolerates no criminal or untoward intent from subjects or visitors. I promise you, man. Intrude upon others. Do not break any laws. And we want nothing more than to keep to ourselves and follow the rules. She and he gives and a steps aside. pointed glare at Metreon. And as as you as she steps aside, she fixes her glance upon Amity and says, "And." Do make sure to keep your demon under control while it's here. MD speaks up. Oh my gosh. I know I look weird. I have red skin, but I'm not a demon, okay? Her gaze snaps back to Aerith and Deer. Keep it quiet. And her gaze fil filters over your pointed ears for a second and her face hardens. And be careful not to stray out of line yourself. Shopier. Earthrendir is going to wait until everyone is inside the gate securely before responding. And then. When the, when the woman says that, Metreon just kind of chuckles to himself. All right. For the record, she is a person, but, but she will not be breaking any laws, and we will be sure to. Follow Good. all that your Baron commands. Make sure it stays that way. Good. Excellent. To begin, you should know, as all guests and citizens should know, that the Festival of the Blazing Sun has decreed to take place in the town square in three days' time. Be aware that attendance is expected. Wonderful. We'll be happy to be there. She mm. nods and steps back. Good. And you hear a Grunt, a grunting squeal as the fence of the gate is slowly closed behind you. Arthur is going to give a look back to the others. I, uh... Good woman. Yeah, isn't she? No, I'm speaking to her. Uh, my lady. Her gaze meets yours as her eyes flick up. Yes? What is it? Is there an, is there an inn or tavern that we might uh, be able to get lodging in? If you're looking for shelter, you can find it at the Blue Water Inn. It can take the visitors to Velaki. It's in the Wonderful. center of town. Much obliged. <laughs> Not a problem. I'm sure that they'll have no trouble keeping your motley companions 
They seem to have had no trouble with the last one. She sniffs and turns back to the gates. Just keep moving. Yeah, we'll head towards, uh, we'll head towards the end. <laughs> yeah. All right. You pass from the earthen road onto cobblestone streets, and behind you, you can hear the clanking of metal as a padlock. As you turn around, you can see it's slowly being fitted onto the bars of the gate. The sky overhead darkening from dusk, night beginning to approach. You see the guards resume their post behind the now closed gate. In the distance on either side of the fortified walls that you can now see are tall 15-foot palisades, vertical logs bound together and sharpened to points atop them. Along the walls, you can see two other figures bearing pikes patrolling the walls atop wooden scaffolding as they look down on the darkened forest beyond. A shiver runs down your spines as you pass down the street, leaving the gate behind. The eaves of the buildings hang with old banners and tattered, tattered fabrics that flap and twist in the chill breeze. The banners are painted with faded words and illustrations, but time has robbed them of both their legibility and any beauty they may have once had. The streets are filled sparsely with townsfolk, many wearing drab, patched gray clothes that have faded with age. They shrink back toward the sides of the streets as you pass, their pale faces growing paler with faint fear at the sight of you. Their dark eyes linger on Amity's horns, and quiet whispers fill the air. You can see that a few townsfolk bear strange, silent smiles, but no mirth reaches their eyes. There's not a glint of hope or joy, only weariness. And as you pass by, the tension leaves the townsfolk, and they return quietly to their business. Yeah, I think, I mean... Unless anyone has objections, I think we're just heading straight towards the inn in whatever, yeah. direction, whatever direction. It's been a long day. Kiva needs to rest something fierce. She's not looking good. Along the way, uh, Lillison is going to sigh and actually smile a bit and say, Well, the casual racism aside, this is actually uh, quite a cheering prospect. The uh, extent to which they emphasize the law means that we at least know what we're getting into here. And uh, looks like they, uh, looks like there's no wolves getting in here. I mean, and uh, Metreon points his thumb back at uh, the pikes with uh, wolf heads on them. Yeah, no, I wouldn't catch any beasts or undead making it through that. means if we don't get shivved in a back alley, we might be vaguely safe. Well, there's a very good uh, way to ensure you don't get shivved in a back alley, you know? Don't go in back alleys? Bingo. Let's go. <sighs> Fair enough. Alright, you continue on, moving forward through the streets. The Central Avenue winds its way, slowly snaking its way through town as you pass between rows of townhouses, smoke billowing from their chimneys. You see the entrance to a large stockyard on your left. On the right-hand side, you can see other old houses rising above the street. You can see other side streets branching off in either direction, filtered by the occasional darkened alleyway. You can see gray-yellowed grass growing long and twisted beneath the stained and sagging wood of the buildings above. It's However, more lively. It's not quite as run down as Barovia, though. The age that you've seen throughout this land is still present here, but there's a tinge of life to the civilization here. As you continue passing forward, you come to a point where the main avenue branches into a single fork leading off toward the north and vanishing around a bend, and the main road continuing forward. Here. You see a new sight. Gray smoke issues from the chimney of this large two-story wooden building with a stone foundation and a sagging tile roof upon which several ravens have perched. A painted wooden sign hanging above the main entrance depicts a blue waterfall. You can see light flickering on the inside as 
the darkened skies overhead begin to turn to a deep grayish black and you can hear the sound of soft voices conversational coming from the inside as you step forward uh, Amity a uh, sudden gust of wind coming from the structure hits your nostrils and you smell a faint scent of something delicious cooked from inside Amity uh, halfway drooling just goes for the door bursting in All right, is everyone following with her? Yes. Hell yeah. yes. <laughs> you pass through the front half ajar door into the structure beyond. You can see damp cloaks hanging from pegs in the entrance portico. Behind you, the volume of the street slowly leaves you behind, and you find yourselves treated with the quiet but comfortable ambience of a tap room. You can see that the tavern here is packed with tables and chairs with narrow paths meandering between them. A bar stretches along one wall under a balcony that can be reached by a wooden staircase that hugs the north wall. Another balcony overhangs an entrance to the east. All the windows fitted with thick shutters and crossbars. Lanterns hanging above the bar and resting on the tables bathe the room in dull orange light and cast shadows upon the walls most of which are adorned with wolf heads mounted on wooden plaques. Several patrons sit at the tables, including two men sitting together wearing furs with, bow with bows strapped to their backs and quivers of arrows set outside their chairs. You can see a matronly woman with a dusky complexion tending bar. She wears a well-made green dress with a silver medallion hanging on a fine chain around her neck and has a trio of black feathers woven into her short hair. At the sight of you, she glances up, and then turns toward an open door to her left through which a, dis a delicious scent wafts and says something quietly that you cannot quite hear. Uh, it, so aside from the two uh, fur-clad men and the bartender, like how packed is this place? As of now, you can see that there appear to be um, a total of six other patrons in addition to the... Uh, uh, two men that seem to be perhaps hunters of some kind, um, a number of them sitting interspersed among different tables. You can see that there's one man sitting alone, two women drinking quietly together, and in the corner, uh, uh, two men and a woman uh, quietly uh, drinking uh, from a set of tankards as they watch the door with minor curiosity. Metron uh, will break away from the group and saddle up to the bar uh, closest to this bartender. Oh, the bar meets your eyes, um, smiling. Uh, Met Metron, you were saying? Yes, my lady. Hi. Uh, uh, me and my company were uh, were visitors, and uh, we were looking for some lodging for the evening, and perhaps a bit of wine to go with it. Hmm. Travelers, of course, you are quite welcome in the <laughs> welcome to the Blue Water Inn. I am Danica. I'd be more than glad to see to it that you are set up with. Uh, Shelter, if you're looking for a room and board, we can take care of that for you. You said you were interested in wine as well. Oh, of course, Danica. Uh, the best that you have on tap. Well, not tap, because you don't really tap wine. You know what I mean. Sorry, it's been a long day. Of course, of course. I'll see to it that um, we can put together what we have. And as she says this, you hear uh, footsteps um, coming from the room behind her. You can see the door open, a uh, uh, waft of steam issuing out, and the delicious smell redoubling as you see a man poke his head outside. Uh, he's a distinguished man in middle age with a long black beard and a silver streak through the middle and around the edges. You can see he seems to be wearing a comfortable wine red coat with aquamarine trimmings and leather shoulder pads studded with silver and small decorative stones. You can see that there's a five-pointed scar over his right eye, but as, as he speaks, you can hear that his voice is warm and his eyes sparkle with kindness as he says, well, good evening. It seems that we have new guests in the inn. Danica, I, has, I trust, has been uh, treating you well? Yes, most gracious so far. Excellent. My wife is the best bartender and one of the only one we've ever had. I, she, I couldn't help but overhear that you were thinking that you might have uh, a meal tonight. Uh, were you looking for rooms as well? Yes, please. Of course, of course. 
Well, I will let my uh, wife handle the transaction. She's much more business savvy than myself, but um, I would be glad to fix something up for the lot of you. And he glances over your shoulder. Have the rest of you guys made your way over to Metreon? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, and Amity's going to be like, oh, everything smells so delicious. What do you have? <laughs> Well, uh, we do have what we can offer to all of our guests. Um, if you're looking, if you buy a room for the night, then uh, we can provide hot beet soup and fresh bread at no additional charge. Just a nice gratuity that we like to offer to our guests. Uh, beyond that, we do offer a uh, cooked wolf steak, and if you'd like, we can offer uh, two kinds of wine. We have the purple grape mash number three, or we have a bit of a choice selection as well, the red dragon crush. If you'd like to splurge a bit, I'd like uh, a picture of each, please. Of course. Well, we can go for pints, but uh, if you'd like to uh, purchase additional ones, again, I'll leave it to my wife to provide that. But uh, assuming you're all staying for the night, I'll get started on a new batch of soup. Uh, and one one moment. The oven. Uh, how much is a room? Danica rolls her eyes. Not, not to worry. It is, um, if you can provide it, it is... Um, it is one electrum for the evening. Arthur Deer snorts. Oh, wow, it's one of these town. So, gladly. Uh, four rooms, please. And she sets down two gold. Uh, thank you. Two gold. All right, so that is four rooms. She glances at it. Uh, we actually only have three rooms available at the moment, but one of them is our uh, larger suite. Uh, it does have a number of additional beds. Um, we do have um, the four-bed suite and as well as two additional rooms of two beds each. Um, which of those would you like to purchase? Uh, hmm. In that case, uh, the large suite and one additional room should suffice. Um, and, and she looks around and does some quick mental math and then just nods and uh, pushes one gold over, keeps the other. She nods. All right. Um, would you like to see if we can send up um, a, a, some furs or something? Uh, it, I'm not sure if all of you were planning on... Well, it seems like there are seven of you and there would only be six beds, but we can see if we can make some arrangements. Oh, don't worry. Some people are sleep sleeping on the floor. Furs would be lovely, thank you. Of course. We can make sure to uh, send up some additional materials. It's not a problem. And in the meantime, God bless. Uh, of course. Um, so, and she uh, moves forward to uh, hand over. Uh, she watches. She kind of like rustles in a drawer for a moment and produces um, seven keys, carefully uh, counting them out. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, four of them are uh, of a similar make, and two of them are of a different make. She kind of glances over them thoughtfully. All right, so um, who should get which keys? I have four for um, the larger suite and two for the smaller one. I think that, and uh, Metron points at Erythrindir, Kiva, and Amity. Give them the two keys. Uh, the rest of us can take the larger suite. I think it makes more sense for Lillison to have this, you know, the more personal room, given she paid for these. Or for Ismark and Irina have to have their own room. I mean, since they're family. Yeah, that would make more sense. Uh, that would mean the five of us in the big room, and then Ismark and Irina in the little one, then, if no one objects. That does seem to make the most sense, unless somebody else wants to shell out for a third room, as she looks at Metreon. Uh, Metreon's looking through his inventory right now. Uh, yeah, as, uh, as soon as you say that, uh, he actually pulls out a gold. I'll take a third room. Well, that's nice and sorted. Danica hands over the keys and flashes each of you a smile. All right, not to worry. Uh, with that, it seems that uh, Erwin is putting together your meals for the evening. Um, if you'd like anything additional, let me know. We, As I mentioned, we can offer cooked steaks. Or um, if you'd like, I can also provide uh, some drinks. Uh, 
let me know what you'd like to order and I'd be glad to put it together. I believe uh, you, sir, were interested in uh, purchasing uh, some samples. And she looks at Metreon. Uh, yes, uh, one of each, please. Of course. Uh, if you're looking to have a pint of each of the Great Mash and of the Dragon Crush, that will be uh, one silver pieces. Y yes, just uh, keep the gold and put whatever that remains uh, from the room to any expense on my behalf. So to be clear, Lillison gave her one gold piece. Um, yeah, right? Metron gave her one gold piece, yeah. Oh, gotcha. She holds up the gold piece. Uh, were you guys going for the third room then? Forgive me if I missed something. Yeah, so we went through the third room is for Metreon. Gotcha. All right, sounds good. Metreon gets the third room key. Um, she nods. Uh, sorry, right. excuse uh, me. Um, your, I'll, I'll open up a tab for you then. Yes. Excuse me. Um, could I also get a uh, a key for that third room? She what? blinks, glancing at Metreon. That is uh, up to the discretion of the guest to pay, I'm afraid. And just in case you lose yours, she says, uh, meaningfully looking at Metreon. Uh, Metreon catches on uh, and turns back to Danica. Uh, yes, just, just the one. She nods. All right, just the one then. Okay, uh, would any of the rest of you like to uh, purchase uh, anything to drink? Any additional uh, food for A me? large glass of the cheap wine, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that'll be three copper pieces, although I'll note it might be cheap, but you'll find that nothing of the Wizard of Wines winery is subpar. I'm sure you will enjoy it quite a bit. Oh, oh, I meant no insult. I'm sorry. And... No, no, not at all. Not at all. None taken. And... All right. Yeah, Earth and Deer will shell that over. Actually, just, yeah, put me on a tab, too. Two silver. We'll see what comes of it. All right. I'll be glad to do so. And she tucks the silver under the counter uh, and begins pouring the drinks. Anything for anyone else? Um, I'll have what, he, what he's having, uh, MB says, pointing at Earth and Deer. And um, as well as the hot beet soup and bread that comes with the room, I guess I'll uh, I'll have a wolf steak. All right. So that'll be uh, w one electron, please. Uh, MB hands it over. All right. Mark off five silver pieces. She gives you a smile. I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. Uh, obtained by our local trap trappers and uh, cooked deliciously by my husband. He makes a mean steak. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Oh, we will. Don't you worry. Once Thanks. the room keys are given out, Kiva's just going to go upstairs silently and go to bed. Danica raises a hand. My dear, if you'd like, I'd be more than glad to show you to your rooms. Um, it's, it's a bit unintuitive to make your way there. That would be great, thank you. Of course. Uh, well, <laughs> putting together your meals, um, would I, could I show the others of you as well? Uh, just to make sure that you know where everything is? Yeah, that would be lovely. I can make sure that your drinks are attended to here. Uh, and Fantastic. you can return them and retrieve them when we are... Yeah. She nods. Of course. Uh, one moment, and she kind of reaches up and removes the apron that had been hanging over her... Uh, uh, green dress and hangs it on a hook next to the bar. Please, if you'll come with me, I will be uh, glad to show you the way. As they walk, Aerithrim Deer will muddled, mutter to the others, I did not get service like this and ends I paid ten times the price for. This is a... Uh... What, what sort of inns were you staying at? Uh, the kind that sailors go to when they're, uh, have a lot of money to burn. You know, in retrospect, that's probably most of it. They, uh, they, they know that anybody who's coming off a day on a ship really isn't too picky about what they're going to be eating or drink later. <laughs> I, I heard you chuckle and say, one of these towns. Well, it, Electrum. Like, who, who uses Electrum? It's, like, you are taking perfectly nice gold and perfectly serviceable silver and turning them into a compound that benefits no one. You can't use it for rare creatures. You can't use the gold for spell components. You are just making something that does nothing and adding it to the currency. Why? Why are they like this? Perhaps that's the point. 
Why? What do you mean? If the point is to remove the usefulness of these metals and making them symbolic value only, well. Oh. Oh, no. I'm going to hold on to the rest of my soap for pieces. <laughs> yes. Good, good idea. Yeah. And somewhat stymied, Harith and is going to follow Danica up to the room. Danica leads the group toward the front entrance of the tap room, hold it, pulling the door open and guiding you outside into the quiet Valachian night outside the front doors. Above, you can see the uh, beams and foundations of the second floor overshadowing the main entrance to the inn. And Danica leads you around and outside a small dirt trail that passes beside a small shed adjacent to the road and away from a low stone well that sits quietly at the southern end of the property. She passes to the left of the shed and toward a wooden staircase that hugs the outer wall of the inn. She turns and leads you up it and makes her way up toward a sturdy wooden door that creaks as it's opened. She holds it open as each of you pass through and then closes it tight behind her. Beyond the door, you can see lies a balcony. This 20 foot long balcony provides a clear view of the bar and has a wooden railing carved with raven motifs. The tap room's many lanterns illuminate the rafters and cast ominous shadows on the peaked ceiling. Danica checks to make sure that everyone is still with her and then continues leading you forward. You can see three doors adjoining to this balcony two on your left side and one at the very end. She gives a nod to uh, Metrion at the first one they pass by, a nod to Ismark and Irina at the second door, and then a nod to uh, the rest of them at the uh, door at the very end. These are your uh, rooms for the night. Um, as you can see, the bar is just downstairs. Um, the tap room is open until midnight um, and uh, opens again at noon. Uh, if you need anything, my family... Uh, uh, does a uh, room across the way, and she kind of points uh, across the room to the balcony on the other side where you can see a few doors uh, standing closed. So if there is anything that matters, just do please feel free to let us know. Uh, but hopefully you shall find your stay here uh, comfortable and welcoming. And uh, we hope you enjoy your time at the Blue Water Inn. Thank you Thank ever you. so much. Um, do you have uh, any bathing facilities? Um, I am afraid not. I can arrange to see if some uh, buckets of water can be brought up from the... Uh, well outside. We might be able to secure uh, an empty barrel or something that might be able to uh, assist in some bathing. That would help so much. Uh, A bucket there's... would be fine if, if that's yeah. all possible. Not. Of course. I will see to it that uh, it is arranged. Were you planning on uh, bathing up here first, uh, or should I, or are you going to return to your drinks and have dinner before uh, doing so? I can make sure that mm -hmm. there is, if, if the latter, I can make sure to have the water uh, waiting in your rooms when you return. In, in, uh, I know, in my room, at least, uh, it's fine. I, I, I prefer to wash myself before I go to bed. You know, you don't want to go to sleep dirty at all. Wash the day's travel away. Of course. It would not be a problem. And same for the rest of you? Yeah, that sounds lovely. Yes, please. Very good. Um, with that, um, I will be down at the bar. If you'd like to return with me, I will make sure to have your uh, drink set out. Otherwise, if you'd like to stay up here, I'll uh, make sure to uh, notify you when your food is ready. She gives you Thank a you very soft, much. gentle, uh, a small bow and makes her way toward the door and exit, uh, making her way down the stairs before the door shuts tight behind her. Uh, moments later, you see her emerge at the tap room below. Metreon, without saying a word, goes into his room. All right. Same with the others. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to go downstairs and start uh, just trying to see if there's sort of a crowd for uh, a little performance, just sort of showing off a few stories. Uh, this is in relation to the background feature where I can perform at a place uh, in order to get some money. All right. If you could send me the text while you do that. Um, 
and we'll get to that in a second. In the meantime, who else is going downstairs or staying upstairs? Erythrindir is probably going to stay up here for a little bit. Uh, Kiva is as well. Lillison is going to take a look at, you know, the three doors and then shrug and go back downstairs. All right. Metro is just kind of freshening up in his room, uh, but he'll be going back downstairs after he does that. Sure. So he's just, like, Kiva, you were making your, you were going into the larger suite? Yeah, she's just going and uh, she'll eat a ration and then she's going to bed. Gotcha. So Ismark and Irina offer the group of you a wave as they enter to check out their own room. Uh, Metreon, as you pass into your room, you can see uh, two cozy beds with matching foot lockers resting in the far corners of this 15-foot square room. You can see wolf furs are hitched atop each bed, and between the beds, a lamp sits at a table under a shuttered window, two tall black wardrobes stand against the wall by the door. Uh, Metreon sees these lockers, but uh, is... You know, he's, he's still in a strange place and a little bit paranoid. Uh, so he takes off uh, his satchel and puts it underneath, underneath the, the bed uh, for later use, uh, but not before, just kind of retouching his face. Um, noticing that the, the gash on his face is still kind of open, is going to be sensitive to it and try to not clog it up with anything. Um, but he'll try to like wipe off whatever he can uh, and then uh, head downstairs. All right, Kiva, as you enter your room, you see... Four plain beds with straw mattresses lining the north wall of this very well-rid room. Each bed comes with a matching footlocker to store clothing and other belongings. A table and four chairs occupy the corner across from the door, and an oil lamp resting on the table casts a bright yellow flame. She is going to um, strip out of all of her bloody armor and clothes and just put them in the footlocker and then sort of um, lay down on the bed facing the wall. All right. As you do, Amity, you return downstairs. Um, where, what kind of position are you taking up, and what kind of story are you telling? Um, interesting. So, I guess in regards to position, uh, she's going to uh, be a sort of at one edge of the tavern, uh, and she's going to be like, "Oh, gather round, gather round! I have a tale," uh, and. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to tell sort of a version of the classic Rumpelstiltskin story, but like inserting a bunch of uh, like riddle components so that it's actually possible to figure out the name instead of being like completely random guessing over the space of all phoneme combinations. <laughs> Amazing. All right, as you do this, you see a number of patrons uh, perk up a bit and turn toward you with vague interest. Most of them don't seem entirely mirthful, but seem to be somewhat grateful for the distraction. You hear one of them murmur, Hey, it looks like we've got the new Rictavio. Let's see if she's any good. His companion responds, Well, she certainly looks weird enough to match him. Wonder if she's a creature from a circus. <laughs> Metreon said, rolls his eyes. Metreon sees that guy say that and looks back at Amity. And for a moment, he looks like he wants to just get up and punch this guy in the face. But then looks back at Amity and turns back to his drink and keeps drinking. Yeah, Amity's not going to interrupt the story to deal with this. Um, she, she just wants to build up a reputation with this. Gotcha. Um, as you finish your story, there's a light smattering of applause. You can see uh, you've attracted the attention of around half of the and that has been listening to your story. And as you step down, you see Danica offering you a, a warm smile and a nod. You can see that she uh, accepts something from the kitchen and holds a uh, platter of a uh, steaming steak. And you can see a number of bowls and plates and trays uh, al aligned with what seem to be bowls of soup and uh, bits of crusty bread sitting and waiting, steaming into the uh, chill air. <laughs> Oh yeah, Amity will start to dig in, uh, sharing with Truffle the soup, bread, and wolf steak. Uh, and she will ask Donica, um, I heard someone mention another storyteller, Victavio. Uh, yes, um, he is uh, another guest of ours. Uh, in fact, he was the only one before you got here. He's a colorful man. Uh, interesting that we should have uh, two such accomplished storytellers at our uh, 
Tavern that one time, but uh, certainly welcome the guests. She grins to uh, Amity. Certainly, if you're going to uh, continue regaling our patrons with such tales, uh, I would certainly be glad to see um, you stay here a bit longer. You seem to be good for business. <laughs> oh, of course. Uh, I, I must get around to swapping stories with Octavio. Well, he, you might see him around here. Um, he sometimes takes to the tap room to uh, share some outrageous tales. Uh, they can be quite entertaining, though. I have my doubts, but he insists that they're true. So who knows? There are many things beyond the mists that I have never seen. So who knows? And with that, Amity will uh, dig into the meal. As you do. Who else was getting food? I'm guessing Metreon and the others, aside from Kiva. Um, Erthrendir is staying back in the room for a moment. Yeah, Metreon um, is... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Lillison will go down to the tap room, um, claim, you know, some food and, like, a glass of wine, and then find the corner, like, farthest away from everybody else to enjoy it. All right. You're able to do so without over much difficulty, and the food is delicious. Uh, Amity, you find that the wolf steak is a bit gamey, a bit tough, but still uh, quite well. Uh, Deer, what were you doing? Uh, staying upstairs? Not for long, but as Kiva kind of gets ready for bed, he's going to settle onto his own straw mattress and say, very quietly, is there anything I can do? Uh, no, go, go enjoy your dinner. I, uh, <laughs> not what I... All right, I, I respect that, but, uh, if there is, or if, fuck, if you just need someone to sit through the trances that we are going to be getting after today, then I'm here. Thank you. He nods. Sleep well. And he's going to do his best to wipe the blood out of it, to wring the blood out of his hair, and head downstairs. You make your way out of the room, outside of the external staircase, and enter once more into the tap room below. You can see Metreon and Amity enjoying their meals and drinks at the bar. You can see Lillison, after a moment, sitting in a darker corner on her side, quietly surveying the rest of the room. As you approach, uh, Danica offers a wave. Ah! Welcome back. Um, were you looking for uh, some dinner as well? I've got uh, uh, some prepared right here. Soup and bread, please, and bless you. And he'll settle next to Amity and Matreon. She uh, rustles toward you and um, begins pulling up uh, the tray. And as she begins handing it over, um, she reaches it out toward you. And as soon as you begin to take it in your hands... You feel something knock up, knock up against your back. I need you to make a dexterity saving throw. Seventeen. All right. The tray clatters for a single terrifying minute and then settles back in your hands and you exhale slowly, watching a few droplets spill harmlessly back into the bowl. Danica's eyes are wide and she whips her head past you. Boys! How many times have I told you? You hear a faint giggling behind you, and as you turn around, you can see a uh, young uh, pre-adolescent boy wearing a uh, coat very similar to the one you saw Erwin Mardikov wearing, with raven black hair and a black fur cloak lined with gray fabric. Standing beside him, carrying a uh, small uh, leather ball, you can see a uh, younger boy, perhaps nine years old or eight, with high cheekbones and silver hair, wearing a wine red tunic and a green cloak over one shoulder. They blink up at the woman owlishly, and you see Danica put her arms on her hips. Brom, Bray, how many times have I told you about running around in the room? The younger boy hesitates to meet her gaze, and the the uh, slightly older boy, who you take to be Rom, says, Well, um, we were just looking around to see what we, we were helping. Danica glowers down at him. You mean to tell me that you were helping, young man, when you nearly knocked this poor man's food all over his lap? <laughs> oh, oh, the no. morning, Lord, stick, you could have... <sighs> it's fine. I've, uh... It, it, it's, no, it's no trouble at all. They're 
they're kids. It's not a problem. <laughs> Danica glowers down at the both of them. Bray, I thought I gave you and your older brother a chore to do, didn't I? I thought your brother, need, your father needed help chopping. You leave him all alone in the kitchen, all by himself. Hmm? Bray looks very sheepish. Um, sorry, Ma, I, I didn't think that we would need... Uh, Bom said it was okay! And he points at him and dashes off away from the bar, um, making a break for the staircase on the opposite side of the room. Brom moves to do the same, and Danica catches him around the wrist. Catherine is going to yell up at the retreating child. That's bad form. You never sell out the sibling. It'll come back to bite you later. You hear a quiet shrieking and giggling from the stairs and as the young boy rounds above the balcony out of sight. And then a moment later, you see a little face peering over the side of the balcony down toward you. Danica <laughs> sighs and glances down at Brom. I'm going to expect you to fetch your brother and complete both helping your father and the task I asked you to complete. We don't want to leave our guests unattended, okay? Brom looks slightly ashamed for a moment and it says, All right, Mom, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. Good. And see to it that your brother does too. I'm not raising any bad seeds here. I expect you to do your jobs as best you can. All right? And she kind of cups his cheek and gives him a little squeeze. And he kind of shakes her away. I, 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 okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. You, don't have, you don't have to be like that. She hmm, gives a kind of chuckle. All right, then get your work done. And don't let me catch you knocking guests over again. Go! And she kind of s smacks him lightly on the shoulder. And he jolts and begins making his way up the stairs to join his brother. You're raising two little bolts of lightning there. <laughs> that I cannot dispute. They can be quite excitable sometimes, but they have good hearts. Yeah, they I can tell. Out of it. Yeah, it's childishness. You're allowed to be there while you can. <laughs> Truth be told, I think I saw them lurking in the corner during your story. And she turns toward Amity with a smile. I think that you've uh, quite enraptured them. They, it's not surprising. They've loved Rictavio's stories, but yours seem to have a little bit of a childish flair. Not not to say that your stories are childish, but I think they enjoyed them quite a lot. Yeah, maybe. Oh, shoot, you told one already? Dang, I missed it. You gotta tell me what it was about later. But... Oh, yeah, I can repeat it when we're, um... Yeah, yeah not tonight. You, 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 don't, you don't tell the same. You're eat. You had a long day. Wolves and shenanigans. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, she'll, she'll continue eating. Arthur Deer will, although occasionally taking a look back to make sure he's not about to be bold into his beet soup. Uh, Metreon this whole time has been, he's let uh, Amity and Arthur Deer sit at the same table he, he, at, 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 I'm sorry, that he's at, but uh, he's been kind of distancing, distancing, uh, distancing them. Sorry, I need to drink some water. Um, he's been distancing himself, but uh, he has been drinking much more rapidly uh, than he usually does. Uh, and by this point, he's probably drank at least three-fourths of a pint of wine and uh, is eating that and is drinking that with his steak. Just not talking to anybody. Ooh. Is it that good, then? They uh, said it was from a good winery. You seem to be taken to it with a plum. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great. Excellent. Arthur Deer is going to take a sip himself. Huh. Yeah. No, I was expecting vinegar. That is... Ooh. Excellent. Man, we got lucky, didn't we? Could have been staying in some hovel tonight, but ended up like this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where are Irina and Ismark again? At this point, they've kind of come down and rejoined the rest of you. They, um, If Metreon and Amity will have them, they'll join you at the table, uh, having their own soup and bread. Okay. Yeah, as soon as he sees uh, Ismark and Irina, he immediately like writes his posture up and becomes a bit more... Um, uh, uh, presentable and uh, welcomes them over. Oh, good of you to join us. Um, Mark nods and Irina gives you a smile. It's good to see uh, 
the rest of you here as well, uh, safe and sound especially. Uh, how, how was the food and the wine? It smells delicious. Exquisite. It's not as good as your meat, but it's it's quite good. This mark frowns. Well, that's a shame. But um, I could try it. I'm sure that they have their own charm. Yeah, I think it may be just that this kind of meat's an acquired taste. Need to want it very badly for it to have the same flavor. He nods. Still, I'm glad to have a uh, full meal in my stomach after today. This was... <laughs> Not what I was hoping for. Yeah, no, you're telling me. Not really what I was... After all the effort we went to to make it out safely, this was unpleasant. Mitron waves Danica down. Danica catches you halfway through uh, placing drinks on a table in the corner where you can see the uh, three patrons there. By now the bar is uh, swelled a bit more populated with others filtering into the night, and now there's a more than 10 people kind of scattered around different tables some at the bar some in their own place uh she gives you a nod and around 15 20 seconds later she's at the side of your table hello again what can i do for you oh i'm sorry it just uh, uh around for these two i'll put it on my gold yep, of course not the problem what will you be having uh purple grape crush or red dragon crush um this is mark and irena exchange glances um, and irena smiles just just um whichever one is uh lower cost we're very appreciative thank you danica smiles not to worry you'll be very glad that you had it one moment and she swoops away back to the bar so lillison has been eating um quickly and quietly this whole time off in her corner by herself and when she's done she's going to stand up leave her um plate behind and come up close behind irena uh, and she's going to lower her voice and say, You were saying earlier something about tomorrow? This wearing off tomorrow? Irina lowers her voice, leaning back, kind of like noticing Amity at the other end and doing her best to avoid speaking where Amity can hear. I think so. From my own experiences with it, it doesn't last forever. It's my hope that maybe by tomorrow morning, tomorrow noon, I'm, I'm not sure. All right. Um, thank you. And Lillison, nodding uh, quite somber, quite somberly to everybody else, is going to go back upstairs and knock quietly on the door where Kiva is. Kiva, uh, after a moment, wraps herself up in a blanket and goes to the door. Is everything all right? Ah, uh, not yet. Oh, um, do you need to come in? Ah, uh, no. Just, mm, how should I put this? Kiva. Yes? When it happens tomorrow come find me i i don't know what you're talking about i know you will okay yeah no problem Wilson just nods and then uh raises her hand um gives kiva a little half wave then turns and goes back downstairs uh, she does not go back into the tap room. Uh, she's actually going to start strolling along the streets, um, seeing if she can get a sort of feel for the layout of this town. Sure. Uh, is there any particular direction she's going? Is she asking around? What is she looking for? Is she just taking a, a night, an evening stroll? Just taking an evening stroll, um, sort of keeping an eye out for any shops or other landmarks, places that the party might want to go to the next day, things like that. All right, well, this is happening. Is anyone else doing anything back at the inn? Just drinking and seething, that's all. Bertram Deer is doing the former, but not the latter, and it's just kind of going to settle down to talk with Amity and Irene and Ismart. Just wiping some wolf juice off of Truffle's face. <laughs> Truffle uh, seems to be enjoying it. 
the predator becomes the, the prey becomes the prey. Erfindir is visibly like slurring at this point. He is several cups in. <laughs> the, the, the one who eats the plants becomes the one who eats the meat. It's ironic. You know, very cool, very uh, good for you, Truffle. You really moving up the food chain. Truffle probably snorts unhappily at you. Uh, but still happy with the meal. I, I, I guess you don't have to be up the food chain if you don't want to. Really, you can stay where you are. Although you are going to be a big boy, aren't you? And this line Jesus continues for several minutes. Uh, and uh, as Metreon starts to interject, you can see that he is also uh, quite deep into the, uh, the wine spirits. Uh, his speech is very slurred at this point, and uh, he's no longer trying to keep up the accent around Irina or Ismark. What? You just have to always keep talking. You, uh, frankly, I'm a kind of past giving a shit whether you want to hear the sound of my voice or not. I, I know I sat at this table, but still, I, uh, have as much right as anybody to... It's been a long fucking day. Yeah, it has, you know. What were you two? Yeah. And, uh, uh, Metron kind of takes his, his fingers and jabs at his neck. Yeah. You just let it, you just let it happen. <laughs> you just fucking let it happen. Unbelievable. Not by choice, generally speaking. Or, yes, by choice, but I was, uh... Not fully in my faculties. Yeah, you can spit it however you, however you want. I don't give a shit anymore. You know what? I was upset earlier today. I was really upset. It's fine, though. I'll see you all for your works. And we, we got here safe, right? What? What are you upset about? We, uh, I mean, it's understandable. We met that man, but... <sighs> okay, yeah. You obviously have something you're looking to say. Why don't you fucking say it? Listen. I know this wasn't... I know it's not anyone's fault, per se. And, uh, Metron looks over at Amity. You almost had me though. I was, uh, I was just trying to look out for you and, uh, well, we're alive at least, right? I'm, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm really glad that you're alive. Just don't, don't do that again. I, I know you were, you were trying to protect me. The world eats people like us up. And I don't ever want you to feel the ghost of the shit I've been through. So. Here's to, uh, here's to safety. And, uh, Metron raises the glass. Here's to you, Izzy, and Arena. Is to them, uh, and he raises his glass up towards the, the rooms that uh, Kiva uh, is in. The point is we got here, right? Right. Here's, here's the safety, and here's to us finding a nice place to sleep. Is Mark and I going to raise their glasses? Catherine Deer does as well. Is Mark grins. All right. To safety and to all of you. Without your help, I don't know that we would have gotten this far. I think I could say the same. I uh, don't know what we would have done if we had come out of that house and not had somewhere to stay. And such kindness as you've showed us. We are in your debt. Although you're in ours, so I guess it evens out. I'm gonna chuckle. Perhaps it does, but... You know, it's it's nice to have 
She shakes her head. Never mind. And she takes a long drink of her wine. You can say friends, Irina. We're all drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, here's to friends. And Farathrin Deer will down his glass. Whew. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. And so, they'll listen. As you're making your way out of the Blue Water Inn, slowly make your way out into the dark streets of Alaki beyond. And as you step through the door and begin making your way outside, you see a uh, figure wearing a colorful cloak with many patches of many different colors and all the shades and uh, tints that you can imagine, though dimly lit by the golden amber light emanating from the blue water and briskly make his way down the path alongside the tavern past you toward the shed. And as you watch, he begins rounding toward the staircase that leads upstairs. Or, sorry, not into the staircase. He moves his way past you toward the tap room. And as he does, you can see that the tips of his ears are very faintly pointed. Lewison lets out a gasp. The man pauses and then turns, offering a wide smile. But hello! You could... It seems that one of my fans have recognized me. Is that so? I... I'm... I'm sorry, sir. I... I don't know who you are, but... She pushes her hair back to reveal her own ears. I... It's so good to see another one of our kind here. Well, my goodness, another half-elf! It's certainly wonderful to see you, my dear. I'm sure that it is a pleasure for you as well as I to meet the great Rectavio. Well, I was just making my way back to my room, but uh, it is certainly good to see uh, not a familiar face as such, but familiar ears, my dear. Yes, very much so. Um, I, I'm sorry, you said fans. Uh, are you a performer? Oh, yes, I am a most excellent bard and performer. All the people shall know me as the greatest carnival man that, well, Barovi has ever seen. Once my act is to together, my dear, none shall escape notice of Rictavio, master of mystery and delights. But for now, if you wish to catch my show, you can find me telling my tales in the tap room, though I am perhaps a bit tuckered out tonight, my dear. But nonetheless, wonderful to meet you. Truly remarkable. She dips uh, a deep, uh, another one of those curtsy bows that she has to do because she doesn't, she isn't wearing a proper dress, and just gives him the widest, most, probably the most genuine smile she uh, has given ever since entering Barovia, and says, I very much look forward to uh, seeing your performance. Um, my name is Lillison. And well met you are, listen. I am sure that there is always room for one more, especially such a charming maiden in my legions of fans. Now, if you'll excuse me, my dear, I must retire to my rooms, but I'm sure I shall see you should you linger in the halls of our dear Blue Water Inn. I look forward to it. Um, good night. The best of evenings to you, my dear. And he flourishes his colorful patched cape behind him with a deep bow. Snaps back up attention with a wink, turns and flourishes his cape as he practically prances into the tap room. For a moment, you hear him say, Good evening! And then the door closes shut behind him. Lawson, <sighs> are you you're still out in the street? Yeah, Lillison is going to uh, just stare at the door for a little while, and then um, that smile still on her face, she will turn and continue on her way down the roads, um, trying to get a feel of the city. All right. As you do, you slowly make your way through the Barovian streets. You can see flickering candlelight 
lingering beyond the shuttered townhouse windows and humanoid shadows moving beyond closed curtains. At this time of night, long shadows lurk in the alleyways where the grass grows long and twisted beneath the stained and sagging wood of the buildings above. This late after dark, the streets are empty, though you can see a single cloaked figure traveling away from you down the central road. In the distance, between beyond the walls, a lone wolf howls in the night, and a cold gust of wind cuts through the night like a knife. Which direction are you traveling in? Um, gonna go south from here. All right, you begin making your way southward through the night, and as you do, you slowly pass between the buildings on either side. Slowly passing down a side street that leads toward the south, you pass between dark structures and buildings, most of them dark, though flickering candlelight stands in the night. As you make your way slowly through the street, you pass by a number of shops, including one cramped store above which hangs a wooden sign shaped like a rocking horse with a B engraved on both sides. Through the dirty glass of the arched windows, you can see jumbled displays of toys and hanging placards bearing the slogan, Is no fun, is no Blinsky. You continue on past the dark storefront into the night, slowly making your way around the south end side as the street bends and turns in the darkness of the night. As you proceed forward, passing your way through the town as you keep clear of the alleyways and do your best to remain on the main roads, you pass upon a mansion with walls of plastered stone that display many scars where the plaster has fallen away from age and neglect. You can see drapes covering every window, including a large arched opening above the mansion's double entrance doors. And as you watch, you can see that one of the doors is open. A large, broad-shouldered man his bald head glinting in the night air, a large axe strapped to his shoulder, is standing at the door. As for a moment at the sound of your footsteps, he glances back and you see his dark, ugly eyes glinting dark. And as you see his hand flecked, you can see a massive clawed aberration of red scales and leathery skin, long claws along his right arm flexing in the night. And then he steps inside the mansion and closes the door, leaving the street dark once again. You continue on forward, passing the mansion behind as you rejoin the main avenue. Are you looking to explore the east side of town first or the west side? Uh, since we came in from the east, um, Lillison will go to the west. All right. You pass your way down the main avenue, passing alongside a few other minor shops and towns, houses, mostly homes, from what you can tell. And as you do, you can see a slouching centuries-old stone church with a bulging steeple on the back and walls lined with cracked stained glass windows depicting pious saints. You can see a fence of wrought iron enclosing a garden of gravestones next to the church and a thin mist creeping along the graves. There's a faint golden flicker of candlelight illuminating from the inside and seeping past the stained glass windows and as you look you can see several silhouettes inside you can just faintly hear the sound of a man's voice ringing out from the interior of the church um Lillison is going to walk up the steps um and just sort of take a take a moment uh standing on the top step to try to compose herself taking deep breaths um and she is actually probably going to stay there for a little while just on top of the steps yep all right you linger there and as you wait there for 10 20 minutes you see one or two others give you a odd look as they make their way down the streets one of them peels off and makes their way up the steps um, as if they'd been headed there and passes by you heading through and as they pass into the uh, main structure beyond opening the door for a second you hear a man's voice uh, telling stories of 
the sun shining down of a greater dawn to come. And then the door shuts again and the voices are muffled and you can see only dark silhouettes huddled together through the stained glass windows of the church. Back in the tavern, are the rest of you still doing anything notable? Or are you looking to retire soon? Uh, drinking but not seething as much anymore. Yeah, that's very much the vibe. Erthrandir is not as drunk as he would like, but also realizes he should not blow through his money on the first day. And he is going to kind of check it. He is kind of doing his best to be the quote-unquote designated driver here and make sure no one's about to, like, slump over. I mean, Metrian's probably at that point, but he's been here a lot, so it's fine. Okay, fair. He is less concerned about Metrion. He can handle himself. But, but yeah, no, once kind of it hits midnight, Erythrindir is going to make sure everyone else can move under their own power and pad back to his room. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just, uh, I'll just go have a, uh, one glass more, and he holds up two fingers. That, that's a two, Metrion. So it is. I'll, I'll take one of those and I'll pay you for it. And he drunkenly scrumbles in his bat in his pouch for change and hands him like five silver pieces. Day air there. That way we both make it and a uh, nobody is uh, too much. Too much would be bad. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? And uh, Metron points down at Truffle. Pig? <laughs> Pig's a good idea. Uh, the pig sort of snorts up at you. <laughs> what are you asking, Trial? <laughs> Do you want a drink? And then he's going to look it up at Amity. Is, uh, grapes bad for pigs? Uh, they can eat pretty much anything you put in front of him, but maybe better not, uh, get him drunk. Yeah, that would be bad. He might, uh, you know... Oh, I'm sorry, I met you. All and uh, and what? Uh, Metrion points up at, at Amity. I could have another glass. There we go. Four more. Three! <laughs> There's three. I can count, I promise. <laughs> oh. You ever think about that? That we just learned to put numbers to arbitrary things? Don't there we go. Really That's don't really three. Is. Please. I don't want to talk about math. <sighs> Fine. I'll just do it in the morning when we're both hungover. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Erthrindir, if I ever confuse four with three, please shut me off. Gotcha. Uh, you have my N likewise. Although at the point I start forgetting basic arithmetic, I'll probably be dead. At which point you have my permission to lay me to rest in a nice casket and wail at my funeral. At least a little bit. Maybe a... You know, to make, make up a nice story about how I, like, died, uh... Saving someone from a tiger. Uh, uh... Sure, Amy says, but she's, um, a little uncomfortable at the sudden analogy. Or, not uh, analogy. You know. Metaphor. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I, I fucked it. Sorry. No, no, no. I, t I, I understand. No, I'll, I'll make up a story about you saving someone from a tiger. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell them a real story about you being, fucking cool. Cause Aww. you are. You're the best. I think you, you've, you've saved us from worse than a tiger already. <laughs> So have you. If you didn't do that big ol' spooky heroism, then I wouldn't have been able to save you, so... I think it evens out. But yeah, no, you're... you're both pretty cool. Metreon's head is down on the table, and uh, he's on the verge of sleeping. Come on. Alright. He's going to weigh blearily at Danica. Maybe no more. He might, uh... I don't know. Would be bad. Danica Lydia's... offers you a nod and she rolls her eyes. She mouths the words, don't worry, and kind of like, like, uh, you know, holds up a 
a bottle of wine and kind of like slides her, uh, you know, hand back and forth under her chin, like shaking her head, like, nope, I got it. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. I will say too that uh, Metreon, being this this wasted, has lost um, some mo mobility, and his tail, which is usually wrapped around his waist, is now kind of dangling. Erythrindir is going to unobtrusively try and tuck that back, but then just kind of pull away. Oh, uh, that. Uh... Oh, you touch him. That's my tail. Oh, why you? Well, I don't that want extra. you to be the same. <laughs> At the... Oh. Please, me paying you for the wine was not me paying you for anything else, my man. Uh, Metron slaps his cheek very lazily. I oh, bet no. <laughs> the hell does that mean? And Metron's head just kind of slumps over and. Oh. Oh. Um. He's got more steak. No. That, 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 I feel like they're out of steak. And as you answer, he's I mean, just kind of passing out at this point. Bark Am gives Amity a <laughs> long look. Do you think... Would you like some help in getting him upstairs? I think it might be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, let, let's get him to bed. Yeah. Yeah, Amity has been blushing since the... Uh, for, for like a solid minute now. But it's very difficult to tell. <laughs> Earthen beer smiles. Yeah, yeah. But the, I mean, I'm not sure you need the help. You're fucking jacked. But, uh, might be appreciated, Miss Danica. Very kind. I am oh. not Danica. <laughs> oh! Oh, I'm dreadful. Oh, I'm sorry. He's that, is that wasted? I don't. He looks for his glasses and puts them on upside down. Oh, who is it? Who is the bartender at the moment? Uh, it's, it's still Danica, uh, but she looks to be oh. at another table. You can see another group of patrons get up and leave, and she goes to begin cleaning up the dishes and tankards left there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. Mamity, we, we got this, right? You know, you, me, mysterious bartender. Oh, yeah, we've, we've got this. Still not the bartender, but... <laughs> is Mark! My man! You doing good? All right. I, I, I think that you you both might... Irina, do you want to give me a hand? And Irina's already up, and she's kind of like rocking Earth from your shoulder. Here, do, do you need a hand getting up? I, I, I can help steady you. Oh, it's fine. And he's going to kind of pull himself upward. If I couldn't handle my drink, I wouldn't get this drunk. And he's just going to lean into her grip. All right, all right. Let's get Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. You're welcome. And just get in too. Leading him upstairs, is Mark raises his eyebrow at Amity. Are you good to make it up on your own, or do you need a hand? Oh, don't worry, I'm going to be fine. Amity says as she sort of slouches into a wall. Mark sighs. All right, well, I'm going to bring him upstairs, but if you're uh, still down here, I'll I'll come back down to give you a hand if you need it. And he slowly, uh, kind of, you know, nuzzles Metreon and gently lifts him up, trying to prop him up as best he can. Slowly, they follow uh, Aerith and Deer, uh, making their way up and out before coming upstairs to the rooms beyond that I presume Amity eventually joins them. Yeah. All right. Together, you make your way once more to your rooms, quietly uh, tucking yourselves away. And as the doors uh, shut tight behind you, the rooms are quiet. The din and conversation of the tap room below fades away to a muffled quiet, the room itself settling into a welcoming, comfortable silence. As you make your way into the beds, you find that the quilts and sheets are warm and not too rough. And beyond the windows, the wind howls, causing the shutters to tremble and rattle, but the chill doesn't find its way inside. The warm candlelight flickering against the sides of the lacquered wooden walls. And here, 
you feel safe. You feel warm. And it's quiet. Metron, in your room, you find, if you're conscious enough to notice it, a small wooden bucket with slightly warm, tending on lukewarm water nestling off to the side of your bed, waiting in case you would like to use it. Uh, he doesn't, actually. He's a little bit too... He's three sheets at this point, probably four. Um, and so when Ismark just kind of sets him down, he just plops uh, into bed. Uh, but I would say, though, at that hour, that magic witching hour, he does get up and in this sort of uh, almost robotic kind of way uh, pulls the bag out from under the bed, pulls the quill uh, and the inkwell out, just takes off uh, his tunic and his jacket, and uh, he's going to, for about an hour, continue to tattoo himself in this sort of state, and after that hour he'll put it aside and fall back asleep. All right. The room falls quiet as you return to your slumber. Uh, Lois and I presume you eventually return to the tavern? Eventually, yes. All right. And the rest of you turn in. Irina and Ismark doing their best to get everyone settled in before retiring to their own room for the night. It's quiet, it's comfortable, and it's calm. And for the first time since you've entered Barovia, you feel behind these wooden walls and in the light of the flickering candles secure is there anything more you'd like to do before turning in for the night no all right with that as a lot of you turn in sleep takes you trancing to others a deep much needed rest to others still the wind shakes and howls outside the windows, but the cold doesn't touch you, nor does the screaming gale. Even as, after midnight, a faint drizzle and rain begins to pitter-patter against the windows, running down the shutters in long, moisture streaks, you the inn remains calm and warm, tucked deep into the sheets and extra furs that the other that the Marta Cubs brought to you. You pass the time away overnight until morning when Kiva and Anthrodir you hear a knock at the door. A soft gray light outside your window. A gentle rainfall falling through the streets. And another knock. One minute. Anthrodir is just going to roll out of bed sort of go to a vaguely upright position and open the door or would he be yeah no no he would who is it kiva would go up and get the door at that point once she's dressed all right kiva you go up and as erthrand kind of intones out his question you click the door open and you see standing there the familiar silhouette of Erwin Mardikov. There's a uh, slightly tight smile across his face, and he inclines his head. Good, good morning. I hope that I'm not disturbing you. I had, well, I thought that it might be best to uh, speak with you before the day begins. He glances down at the tap room, and a bit of concern flits across his eyes. Before, um, well, before things get too noisy. Uh, come in. Yeah, shall we, uh, wake up, uh, and he kind of jerks a finger towards Amity. If it would not be of much trouble, I want yeah. to make sure that, well, the lot of you seem very kind, and I'd like to do what I can to make sure you're well informed. And yeah. he nods, giving you a small smile. Catherine Deer will walk over there and gently shake her shoulder. Hey, morning. Hey, uh, Amity? Uh, Amity wakes up 
groggily, a bit zazzled. We got a visitor. He wants to talk to us about something important. Then you can go back to bed, I presume. Is it Rectavio? Don't think so. It's a Mr. Martikov. Amity <laughs> shakes herself awake. Uh, um, hello. Erwin uh, gives a nod and a smile as he shuts the door behind him. Good morning. Uh, forgive me for intruding. I didn't wish to bother you. In fact, it's quite early for me. Um, but with that said, as I've told your friend, as you are newcomers to Velaki, there are certain expectations that I thought you might be aware of. In other words, I wouldn't want you to go far astray. Such ill decisions might prove quite hazardous to guests that don't expect them. And with that, we'll take our break until next week. Ooh. Huh. Intriguing. Huh. Hmm. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. We are going to pick this up next Saturday at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. With, just so you, as a reminder, we do have the new subreddit, r slash twice bitten DD. Hope to see you all there. We will have discussion thread up for this episode and hopefully soon recaps as well. Uh, otherwise, Thank you all for joining us this fine day. Uh, we will see you all back in the mists next Saturday. Until then, be wary of wolves in the woods and take care. <laughs>